A couple of years ago, during COVID second wave, my father died in an intensive care unit. It was in a COVID ward. Visitors were not allowed, and he effectively died alone, as perhaps we all do. I have had friends spend time in ICU, some as patients and some as doctors, tending to many who are losing their lives and perhaps losing their senses before that. And these medical care professionals also have to tend to the relatives of the patients, struck by panic and grief, facing the truth of their mortality, and perhaps asking if love is futile. It's hard being in intensive care, whether you are on a bed or standing beside it, weighing up the balance between treatment and care. My guest today has had over two decades of experience in intensive care units, and he says in this episode that he has never saved a life; he has only postponed death. Perhaps this is the only consolation we have when we lose a loved one. We will all die, and a lesson we could take from this is that while we are alive, we must all be fully alive, uncompromisingly, unblinkingly, excruciatingly, wholeheartedly, passionately alive. What we have will be taken away. Hold on to it with love. Welcome to the Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the Seen and the Unseen. My guest today is Nitin Arora, a specialist in intensive care to the point that he's written books on it and is considered one of Britain's top experts in the subject. He lives and works in Birmingham, and we had a fabulous conversation on a subject most of us would prefer to ignore, but one day we'll almost certainly have intimate experience of intensive care units. He speaks about what intensive care involves, the differences between Britain and India, why India has both the best and the worst doctors, how he has dealt with patients and relatives. How he dealt with COVID and the subject of PTSD among ICU survivors. At least as many ICU patients later suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder as do soldiers who have been to war. And you will find in a massive TIL after the three-hour mark that it's far worse for women. In the first part of this conversation, we speak of Nitin's journey from Punjab to England and why he now speaks more Punjabi in Birmingham than he used to do in Amritsar. Much insight here. But before we get to the conversation, let's take a quick commercial break. Hey, the music started and this sounds like a commercial, but it isn't. It's a plea from me to check out my latest labor of love, a YouTube show I am co-hosting with my good friend, the brilliant Ajay Shah. We've called it Everything Is Everything. Every week, we'll speak for about an hour on things we care about, from the profound to the profane, from the exalted to the everyday. We range widely across subjects and we bring multiple frames with which we try to understand the world. Please join us on our journey and please support us by subscribing to our YouTube. YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Amit Varma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. The show is called Everything is Everything. Please do check it out. Nitin, welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. Hi, Amit. I've been a fan of your podcast for many years. I've spent endless hours listening to your podcast. And I am very, very happy to be on your podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, and I'm, I'm a little feeling a little guilty now that you spend many hours on my podcast because the work that you've done in the last few years, especially as a senior intensivist in the UK during COVID, training other people, running your own operations, not just being, you know, one doctor among many is so incredibly important that now I'm beginning to worry if there has been any huge health impact of my podcast being heard by people like you. But I will presume you had the discretion to listen to it in your free time. <laughs> I have. I have. And actually, it was one of the healthiest things I did listening to your podcast. I would suggest that listening to your podcast and to listening to, and I won't name him, the former editor of the Indian Express. And the former writer of Rude Food. <laughs> that's, the, that's the three three things that kept me sane <laughs> during, during the last three, four, five years. 
good to hear that and you know shekhar gupta and veer sang we are both very fine people i presume you are referring to them and uh, oh, uh, veer of course has yeah, been on the show other seedha naam hi le lete bhai but no no but i am also uh, I, i i think they both do sterling uh, public service and, and and so do you and i'm glad to have you on but before we get to talking about your sterling public service so before we get to talk to your career in medicine i want to get to know you nitin arora the person a little better so take me back to your childhood where were you born what were your early years like give, give me a sense of that okay so my parents are both doctors i was born in pgi chandigarh nitin i'm sorry to interrupt you i never interrupt but i was also born in pgi chandigarh so that makes two of us <laughs> we can continue <laughs> wow bhai I also studied in DAV Chandigarh. ठीक है ना? That I didn't. So, that I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I was born in PGI Chandigarh because I was a complicated pregnancy. <laughs> so and and my mother was a resident over there. However, yeah. Then we, I, uh, my 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 parents. and my grandparents all were from what do we call it now we call it pre partition punjab so they all migrated from pre partition punjab from the other side to this side and obviously there were tragedies there was familial trauma what we now tend to call intergenerational trauma and they ended up in an area around ferozpur in punjab so that's where i spent most of my childhood i spent most of my childhood actually in in in, in a little town which is actually famous for being the birthplace and the hometown of a former president of india gani zal singh uh, faridkot so i i spent probably what 12 years in faridkot i was just just like you i was a child of privilege born to two doctors who worked in government service who had a little bit of private practice on the side and basically studied in the best school in the district and you 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 will understand what that feels like so and at that point it didn't feel like privilege it felt like everyone else it felt like when I mean, this is what all of my friends are like <laughs> but uh, now 40 years later 50 years later uh, it i realize how big a privilege it was and then i studied in a school where and this is small town india when I mean, freethcourt had a population of less than 80000 people at that point and this school that i studied in where i was at one point the head boy <laughs> and uh, i was the class prefect for but four years we had a 2 rupee fine for any time that you didn't speak english wow you know how it was Uh, you 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 know how it was like in 80s punjab if i can speak in punjabi asli punjabi jo hai 
ਕੁੱਤੇ ਨੂੰ ਅੰਗਰੇਜ਼ੀ ਚ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਸਿੱਟ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਨਾਲ ਹਿੰਦੀ ਚ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਤੇ ਦੋਸਤਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਚ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਸੋ ਟੂ ਟ੍ਰਾਂਸਲੇਟ ਯੇ ਯੇ ਟਾਕ ਇਨ ਇੰਗਲਿਸ਼ ਟੂ ਯਰ ਪੈਟਸ ਯੇ 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 ਟਾਕ ਇਨ Hindi to your kids and you talk in Punjabi to your friends only and yeah that was the sort of extremely snobbish privileged school that I went to and then I was um, educated in loose terms very loose terms <laughs> but i i i learned a lot of book knowledge i was a very privileged child in that i had um an almost photographic memory i can still tell you what page 249 of my punjabi textbook in class 8 looked like so i was yes i was extremely privileged uh both in terms of family circumstances and my memory however for some reason i decided to go into medicine possibly because most of my parents were doctors uh <laughs> that could that could be that could be a good reason however you didn't go into civil services did you <laughs> no no in fact i became a staunch libertarian and enemy of the state despite my father being in the ias <laughs> so there you go <laughs> yeah uh, and i am an enemy of medical education <laughs> so I did decide to go eventually in in favor of medical education. So I did my MBBS from Amritsar from in Punjab and as you will understand and as most people listening in India will understand that in the late 80s and early 90s Amritsar was let's say the hotbed of extremism would you agree with that term till the mid 80s yeah i mean after that to sab theek ho gaya but late 70s early 80s for sure it was uh, yeah, from the outside yeah. it seemed like a place fraught with a lot of violence and so on ha to main wahan pe bada it was not uncommon for my medical college to be shut down with आज स्ट्राइक है सब घर जाओ तो ही जस्ट डिड दैट ही जस्ट डिड दैट देयर वाज देयर वाज नो ऑप्शन रियली नाउ बिफोर आई हर्ड योर पॉडकास्ट फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम आई हैड नेवर हर्ड द वर्ड libertarian when i heard your podcast i realized that i had been a libertarian for a huge amount of time without actually understanding that word so my parents were both professors in the medical college i studied in dheere dheere i understood how controlling the bar meri can i talk about personal stuff here with you absolutely absolutely ha to meri pehli girlfriend ko jab pata laga unko to my parents called her into the office and said oh 
تو اس سے بات کرنا بند کر دے نہیں تو تجھے فیل کر دیں گے او مائی گاڈ تو یو نو ہاؤ لائف ورکس ان انڈیا اینڈ اسپیشلی ان ایٹیز اینڈ نائنٹیز انڈیا اینڈ دین آئی وینٹ تھرو مائی ایم بی بی ایس سو میں نے ڈگری کر لی اس کے بعد آئی اسٹارٹ اپلائنگ فار پوسٹ گریجویٹ انٹرویوز اینڈ ایگزامس اینڈ آئی فال ان لو ود سم ون دیٹ لیوز ٹو ہاؤسز اوے تو دس از دس از دا نائنٹیز سو دیر از نو اسکائپ there is no video chat available so what we do is both of us take our cordless phones out and go to the chhat to the roof <laughs> to the, the, <laughs> and so we can see each other and we can talk to each other without having to shout so we call that video chatting lovely wow <laughs> <laughs> so this is video chatting in the 90s we get married without consent of parents and then basically i have to threaten my professor and my wife's professor at one point with going to the media ke acha because both of them threatened ke hum tujhe pass nahi karenge why were your teachers behaving like that well um, <laughs> my parents were professors both of them uh, in the same medical college that we were both training in تو وی میرڈ ود آؤٹ کنسینٹ کس ویل ود سوری نو ون کین میری ود آؤٹ کنسینٹ آئی آئی ووڈ ری فریز دیٹ وی وی میرڈ ود آؤٹ پرمیشن فرام آر پیرنٹس کس نو ون کین میری ود آؤٹ کنسینٹ فرام یور پارٹنر اینڈ مائی پیرنٹس ور ناٹ ہیپی that I was marrying someone that was slightly older than me and had been divorced in the past. And as you, as you will know, in, in 90s India, a marriage, well, a, 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 essentially a love marriage and also a marriage where one partner has been divorced in the past was a complete no no so it was a huge huge problem and so what happened was that my parents because they were very influential and they were both professors in the medical college they tried to influence others the so i managed punjabi mein bolo bolo sir main basically تھکا لگا کے وائف دی تے کرا دی ٹھیک ہے ڈگری پوری کرا دی میری نہیں ہوئی او مائی گاڈ اٹ واز اینڈ ایٹ ون پوائنٹ آر پروفیسر اسٹور ڈائز ویری کلیئرلی دیٹ انلیس یو لیو ایچ other we will not give you your degrees you will not pass 
एट दैट पॉइंट आई सेड अच्छा मुझे कर दो फिर एंड एक्चुअली हाँ डिड दैट हैपन टू मी तो बट यस माई वाइफ पास्ट शी वॉज अपॉइंटेड एज एन असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर एट अमृतसर मेडिकल कॉलेज बट देन when i decided that i wanted to that i wanted to do intensive care in the uk um she chose to come with me so i mean that's that's huge sacrifice when a, a prestigious government college job in india is huge so i decided to come to the uk to do intensive care and then i first did my mrcp so that's my medical training then i did frca which is my anesthesia training and then i did dicm and fficm so that's my intensive care training so basically it took a total of nearly एट ईयर्स तो तीन डिग्रियाँ करनी पड़ी जिस मेडिसिन एनस्थीजिया और इंटेंसिव केयर टू डू इंटेंसिव केयर इन द यू के फॉर द लास्ट फाइव ईयर्स ना आई हैव बीन चेयर ऑफ द एजुकेशन डिपेजन फॉर द इंटेंसिव केयर सोसाइटी सो आम एन इलेक्टेड मेम्बर ऑफ द एग्जीक्यूटिव बोर्ड एंड आई बीन चेयर ऑफ education for a, a, a number of years now we do a lot of we through covid especially we did a lot of webinars we did a lot of online teaching stuff and we did a huge amount of both online and offline depending on how you describe it when our emails online or offline <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but we did a lot of teaching around covid and because after italy britain was the next country that got a huge big wave of covid the indian society of critical care medicine somehow decided that they wanted to invite me as an external advisor on their online teaching webinars all of that stuff so i ended up doing a lot of work around there now i have if if i had my choice in the day remember in the late 80s so you are you are, you are only what Three years older than me, something like that. So you remember that at that point in India, your choice was: can you be a doctor or an engineer? Or do you remember anything different? No, no, pretty much was it. And after a certain point, you know, MBA, MBA options opened up, but doctor, engineer, or civil services were the deep thing, or or just kind of thing. The third option was. अच्छा दिल्ली में सेंट स्टीफन जाओ बिकॉज दैट दैट वॉज योर ऑलमोस्ट गारंटीड एंट्री इन टू द सिविल सर्विसेज एंड ऑब्वियसली बिकॉज यू 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 कम फ्रॉम अ सिविल सर्विसेज बैकग्राउंड हमारे तो भैया कोई यूनिवर्सिटी नहीं गया था मेरे पेरेंट्स से पहले तो हमारे सिविल सर्विसेज वॉज अ अ डिस्टेंट ड्रीम सो इट वॉज अ केस ऑफ डॉक्टर बनोगे या इंजीनियर बनोगे सो अच्छा ठीक है भैया डॉक्टर बन जाते हैं बट माई फर्स्ट लव वॉज हिस्ट्री माई सेकेंड लव वॉज फिजिक्स एंड इंटरेस्टिंगली दे बोथ कम इन हैंडी बिकॉज what i ended up doing during covid 
was helping because I was already an I was already chair of the education division in the intensive care society of the UK and I was an external advisor at the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine and in a number of states and I'm actually not allowed to say what states but um, I ended up advising a lot of people about oxygen delivery about so so so, so some interesting facts in the uk so as you know when you have a big oxygen tank with liquid oxygen in it if oxygen evaporates the rest of the liquid oxygen will become warm because of latent heat so we actually had to install uh, sprays around it india me it's the other way around because the temperature is 45 degrees so for instance in rohtak they had to put cold water sprays on it on the oxygen tanks so that they would not get over pressurized if that makes any sense the ye choti choti cheeze jo thi which is stuff that is an intersection essentially of physics and medicine that made i think it made a difference uh, maybe that's just my ego talking okay <laughs> however what 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 we are primarily after today is talking about end of life care in india isn't it the should we shift from my background let's no 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 Let, let's in fact go much slower we'll cover all of these topics in detail covid intensive care end of life but i want to kind of take a, a step back and ask some broader questions taking okay. off from uh, what you were speaking about and the first of my broader questions is this that in our lives you know we often we often judge people for what they are like somebody is a particular way and they occupy a fixed uh, spot in our mind it could be a parent it could be an elder it could be a friend and they are exactly that and uh, you know and we judge them as being that and uh, we put a label on them and that's pretty much what they are and it is often only much later that we look back and begin to peel the layers and see what made them and there is i think a physical analog of this which doctors go through in the sense that we take our bodies completely for granted but at some point i presume uh, during your medical education or med- medical practice you begin to understand the body for what it what it is how the different organs work in different ways how people's behaviors can be impacted by little minor things that don't seem consequential but you know slight change in the chemical balance in your brain could make you a completely different personality and uh, and you begin to understand uh, a body not as just you know one random thing out there but as a collection of parts working in particular ways and everything has a cause and everything has an effect and so on and so forth and the other analog of that is looking at people in that way for example for me it would be thinking back in time and for you know my father was always like a fixed spot in time okay that's my father and that's a word and he is one particular person in a particular personality comes to mind did too with my mother did too with other people in, in 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 my life but now i can sit back and i can look at them through their many phases i can look at my father's pictures when he's 20 when he's 18 when he's 25 and see the evolution of a person and begin to kind of understand uh, what kind of goes on there so i am curious to learn about that process for you because it is analogous to in a sense i think understanding the body which you begin to understand in systematic ways but when you look back at the people in your past like when you look back for example at your parents or the way they behaved or when you think of what you described as intergenerational trauma you know coming down from there what do you see differently do you see clearer now is perhaps some of your anger or sadness of that time dissipated 
can you see the different layers of them how do you relate to them how do you relate to the past how did this process happen in you because it did not happen to me when i was in uh, when i was young it took me a lot of time to grow older and begin to sort of have the ability to look back objectively with a little bit of wisdom and see uh, what what what's going on so tell me a bit about that um it took a long time it took a very long time to get over this over the intergenerational trauma and you have to and what 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 i missed saying was that my grandparents were from all four of my grandparents were from west punjab so from what is now pakistani punjab so they all went through uh, partition uh, migration living in refugee camps having to essentially hold their hands out for food and eventually yeah okay they 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 turned out fine but that was a traumatic experience for both grandparents and parents and i believe that that actually shaped some of their personalities but some of it was just about how india was in the 70s and 80s so some of i i i have heard a, a lot of stories including okay i i i'm i'm not going to say exactly who but one of my wife's relatives basically decapitating his daughters before migrating to india cuz he was afraid they would get sexually assaulted on the way from west punjab and that sort of and 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 there's loads of stories including my another one of one of my mother's relatives who didn't who basically forget tattoos put bits of chips of diamond and gold under her skin before coming to india and then had them took out uh, so she could preserve essentially the family wealth and that sort of thing is something that you cannot ever forget i mean i know you you you're not punjabi but you lived in chandigarh for half of your life didn't you actually i'm half punjabi and my father was born in lahore bhai mujhe pata nahi tha no no i'm 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 culturally bengali my mother is bengali and my father was brought up in calcutta where they had a roaring yeah, love affair yeah, yeah. so i'm i'm culturally so, so that's, bengali that's what i i thought but i didn't realize that you were actually you know at least generationally or genetically punjabi <laughs> yeah yeah he was born uh, in uh, i think shekhupura which is on part yeah, of lahore or whatever shekhupura yeah. is shekhupura he, he was is born where, there where, where, where one of my uncles was born there you go <laughs> <laughs> so, so so it's it's uh, and you lived in chandigarh while i was studying in chandigarh so, and i was born in pgi uh, as were you so t- i was connections. born in pgi yes yeah yeah exactly so yes lots of similarities okay so where were we you were talking about the intergenerational trauma and where yeah, it came yeah, from yeah, and yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so 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 i think as much as i can talk about intergenerational trauma now you said you had about five things to double click on so <laughs> the intergenerational trauma was the first one <laughs> was the next one the next one i'm very curious about is 
you know you mentioned that you were brought up in privileged elites much as i was uh, was privileged english speaking elites and one of the bad attitudes i kind of picked up was this sort of language snobbery where uh, you know obviously oh, my english was yes. great and i was like you know for me western culture was a pinnacle of everything so for a few years i almost had this kind of snobbish attitude towards local culture local stuff and all of that which thankfully i outgrew and uh, in fact i regret not having that as a bigger part of my life so far but you mentioned about uh, you know you mentioned in your beautiful punjabi about how you know you speak english to the dog and uh, hindi to your children and punjabi to your friends so tell me about uh, you know and in your school you were fined if you did not speak in english so tell me about you know that aspect of you like was that something that you had to work on doing in terms of a sort of embracing mm-hmm. who you are and embracing your punjabiyat to say because we contain multitudes and it is sometimes tragic when we ignore some of those and focus on others so what was that process for you like in terms of forming or defining your identity ki who am i am i an english speaking kid who's done medicine and i'm going to birmingham or whatever or am i basically a thet punjabi in this a lot of that left in me you know tell me a little bit about that process of you know being comfortable in your own skin uh it's really 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 difficult and and actually my wife era and i have spent ages talking about this over the last what 20 30 years nahi 30 years nahi bhai main usko sirf 26 saal pehle mila tha so it's only 26 years <laughs> so, <laughs> so we've spent a huge amount of time talking about this and it's a case of and this is one of the very rare moments where i will agree with chetan bhagat <laughs> when he says india is divided into divided into two classes the english speaking class and the non english speaking class and that is actually correct in my school if we spoke anything other than english in our, except in our hindi or punjabi period we were fined and uh, unfortunately that that leads you to the english speaking upper middle class elite snobbery uh, where you know you talk to your cousins uh, you talk to other people and they if they don't speak great english or if their accent is not bbc or voice of america you think they are not smart enough or they are not up in your social class i think that that is more accurate uh, in your social class and uh, it took me a very long time uh, it took me until my late 20s to understand that a lot of my patients and it 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 was only after so unfortunately i did not get self realization while i was a student it was only after i became doctor that i realized that a huge number of my patients and their relatives actually understood what i was saying even though they did not speak great english kyunki until i went to medical school i my interaction with non english speaking upper middle class people was very limited and i'm sure it was very you you must have had a very similar experience until you went out into the wider world your interaction with non upper class english speaking people is minimal isn't it सिर्फ दुकानदार और सब्जी वाला और दूध वाला सो या इट 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 टुक मी अ लॉन्ग टाइम टू गेट ओवर दैट प्रेजिडिस थिंकिंग दैट इन इंडिया ओनली पीपल दैट कैन स्पीक इंग्लिश आर वर्थ टॉकिंग टू 
So then I had to make a conscious effort to actually start talking to people, talking to patients, talking to their relatives, and talking about lots and lots and lots and lots of serious stuff in Punjabi, Hindi, English, whatever. However, I speak more Punjabi now. Uh, no, let me clarify that. I speak more medical Punjabi now than I did when I lived in India. Because in India, in Punjab, in a good hospital, in a Punjabi would rather die than speak in Punjabi to their doctor. They will wow. speak in English. Wow. Standard ki baat hai na? Mm. Standard kam ho jayega na? Punjabi bolenge to. So, whereas, when I work now, about 60-70% of my patient load is from either side of Punjab. So, either Indian Punjab or Pakistani Punjab. And Indian Punjab, as you know, is only, what, two, two and a half crores in population. Pakistan, Pakistani Punjab is 13 crores in population. So, Zatar Urdu bolne wale. So, now, yeah, or Punjabi. Because they all understand Punjabi. So, I speak more Punjabi in Birmingham than I did in Amritsar. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so weird. <laughs> Sorry, I have forgotten. You asked me about five questions and... Um, no, no, this was the second. I'll, I'll, I'll go one by one. I have only went for the first two. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I'm, I haven't asked the others yet. Uh, I'm going in order. Yeah, but yeah, about co- sort of coming to terms with language and all of that. And uh, and it's fascinating that you know you should speak more Punjabi in Birmingham than in Amritsar. I think that does say more about Birmingham than... And it says a lot about both Birmingham and Amritsar as well. <laughs> it does. My ne- yeah. So my next question is this, that, you know, in our time, pe, yeah, you options say ki, you know, medical karo, engineering karo, doctor bano ya engineer bano. Today there are way more options. And uh, today I remember a young uh, distant relative was just choosing to do medicine and all of that and going full time into studying uh, for, you know, doctory as I say. And, and a predominant opinion, though he eventually went for it, but the predominant opinion among other family members I noticed is that don't do it because it will take many, many years. It will take a decade and a half. Aapne bhi ka ki, you know, four years of medicine, four years of anesthesia, four years of intensive care. Bahut saal beech jayenge. Us time pe aap zada kuch kamani rahe ho. You're working like a complete dog. All your peers in engineering and MBAs and whatever are getting ahead, going abroad, buying flats. You're just working like a dog day in and day out. And then at the end of it, you never know if you'll actually make it to the top so it could all be wasted and you would have had no more options and you'd be in your 30s so that's kind of one view that one gets of the risk that it takes to become a doctor and therefore my assumption is that you know that if if you really want to succeed as a doctor it is not just enough to have the qualities necessary to be good at the the, the subject whatever they, those are but also you need to kind of have a passion for it and an accurate view of what it entails like some people might get carried away by the romanticized notion of the successful doctors they see which would be falling for selection bias and then they would you know, want to do medical for that. And very soon they find out that, fuck, it's not quite all that, but it's too late for them. Or others might come in because they are fascinated by the science of medicine. But then they realize the practice of medicine is different from the science of medicine. And now you're kind of stuck in that sort of field. In your case, I imagine with both your parents being doctors, practicing doctors, you would have sort of gone into it with your eyes open. So tell me a little bit about, like, it's a two-part question, really. Uh, And one is a personal part that how was it like you were you always in love with the subject or having got into it you were just diligent and you uh, got the job done and the second is that you know what is it about the system that more than any other profession this basically requires you to go all in 
कि आप 10-12 साल पढ़ो यूर इन योर थर्टीज बाय द टाइम यूर डन एंड इफ यू डोंट मेक इट योर स्क्रूड बिकॉज देर आर नो अदर ऑप्शन अदर ऑप्शन वेर इज इंजीनियरिंग करके आप एम कर सकते हो वो कर सकते हो ये कर सकते हो बट हेयर यूर काइंड ऑफ योर यूर ऑलमोस्ट गोइंग ऑल इन इन टू द प्रोफेशन ओके सर दैट्स दैट इज ट्रूली अ ट्रू टू पार्ट क्वेश्चन एंड मैं आपको सच बताऊं इफ आई हैड अ चॉइस और अगर मेरे पेरेंट्स एक स्मॉल टाउन पंजाब में ना रहते होते तो इफ माय पेरेंट्स वर लिविंग इन से दिल्ली आई वुड हैव आफ्टर माय टेंथ स्टैंडर्ड और ट्वेल्थ स्टैंडर्ड आई वुड हैव अप्लाइड टू probably st stevens to do history my first love and my and it is actually not just first love is wrong my everlasting love is history to main history padhta hu sara time ab main history of medicine padhta hu i'm actually writing a book on the history of medicine ऑन द हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंटेंसिव केयर एक्चुअली क्योंकि वो मेरा स्पेशलिटी है बट मुझे माई फर्स्ट लव वॉज ऑलवेज हिस्ट्री सो बट एट दैट पॉइंट इन इंडिया इन द लेट एटीज अर्ली नाइन्टीज हिस्ट्री वॉजेंट अ रियल करियर ऑप्शन यू हैड यू नो थ्री फोर फाइव हिस्टोरियंस दैट हैड मेड इट बट एवरी वन एल्स यू वर destined to be essentially a school teacher if you did history the option kya tha it was a case of okay the only realistic career options were medicine engineering or civil services never wanted to do civil services so then it was a case of okay uh, maa baap doctor hai डॉक्टरी तो पता है थोड़ी थो, थोड़ी बहुत ठीक <laughs> है यही कर लेते हैं इवन तो माय मैथ्स वाज प्रिटी गुड माय मैथ्स वाज बेटर देन माय बायोलॉजी सो द रीजन आई थिंक व्हाई पीपल टू मेडिसिन इज टू फोल्ड ओके एंड आई थिंक आई आई कैन व्यू इट फ्रॉम two angles both from the indian angle and from the british angle so in india it's a case of no doctor ever dies poor you will never be mega rich but you will never be poor so you will always be and 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 most states have enough government medical jobs which pay enough for essentially an upper middle class salary so it is a very 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 safe career and uh, it is very unlikely that you will ever be poor so it it makes it a very safe career um it is possible that you may become mega rich but that is unlikely it happens only to very 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 few people but uh, you will always be in the top you know 2% of the society so which i suspect is why a lot of people go into medicine the other reason obviously as you would expect a die hard medic to say is vocation it's a caring profession if you want to do it you want to do it so if you want to help people if you want to look after people you will do it regardless of the money well the money is important which is why you have doctors striking sometimes but and nurse is strike but the, it's 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 not just about the money it is about yeah okay fine you are in the top 2 3 4% of the earning population but you are also making a difference rather than 
कि अच्छा आप इन्वेस्टमेंट बैंकिंग कर रहे हो तो आप क्या कर रहे हो और यू आर हेल्पिंग विद टेक ओवर्स एंड लेइंग ऑफ पीपल तो आप वॉट वॉट आर यू डूइंग विद योर लाइफ वेयर इज योर सो अ वेरी लॉन्ग टाइम अगो अबाउट थर्टी ईयर्स अगो समन टोल्ड मी वन ऑफ माई सीनियर्स सेड कैन आई से दिस इन हिंदी क्योंकि इट साउंड बेटर इन हिंदी हिंदी में बोलिए प्रोफेशनल सेटिस्फैक्शन तीन चार तरीके से आती है ठीक है एक है कि अच्छा आपकी डिग्रियां कितनी है दैट इज योर प्रोफेशनल सेटिस्फैक्शन दूसरा है पैसा कितना कमा है दैट इज योर सेटिस्फैक्शन तीसरा है कि आपने कितने वॉट काइंड ऑफ डिफरेंस हैव यू मेड टू अ लॉट ऑफ पीपल्स लाइफ ठीक है वो है प्रोफेशनल सेटिस्फैक्शन एंड द लास्ट वन इज के आपने हाउ मेनी हाउ मच ऑफ अ सॉरी इट्स नॉट द लास्ट वन How much of of difference have you made to society? And the last one is, okay, if you think you've made a difference, how many people have you taught to make a difference? And you decide कि अच्छा आपका professional satisfaction कहाँ से आता? And It is different for everyone. What do you think? I mean, you know, at some point during this podcast, we're going to have to talk about the uh, World Test Championship <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> I I cannot finish a conversation with you without talking about cricket. <laughs> Definitely, we'll talk about cricket. But I I I love this formulation of. professional satisfaction and for me it would actually be only the third and the fourth matlab degree degree to mere paas hai nahi kuch as far as money is concerned if i have enough to get by and live comfortably which you know by the grace of this flying spaghetti monster i do and by the grace of my listeners who support the show you know that's good enough for me but it's really the third and the fourth and you've kind of made me think a little bit more about this but i want to ask my next question also sort of based on this विच इज कि आपने कहा है कि दो कारण हो सकते हैं कि आप मेडिकल कर रहे हैं एक कारण है कि इट्स अ सिक्योर्ड जॉब यू विल बी इन द टॉप टू परसेंट ऑफ अर्नर्स इन द कंट्री एंड दैट्स अ रेस्पेक्टेबल रीजन द सेकेंड इज डेट यू कंसिडर इट अ वोकेशन एंड यू आर ड्रिवन बाय आइडियलिज्म एंड यू वॉन्ट टू हेल्प पीपल इन इन अ टेंजिबल वे बाय द वे आई मस्ट डिफेंड इन्वेस्टमेंट बैंकर्स इन से दे आर ऑल्सो गुड फॉर सोसाइटी हैव गॉट एन ओल्ड एपिसोड ऑन द इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ फाइनेंस विद अजय शाह आई लिंक दैट फ्रॉम द शो नोट सो I I I I agree but, investment mm-hmm. bankers are important um, yeah <laughs> they, they are they are very important to society yes and then but leaving that aside so these are the two kinds of reasons one is that uh, it's great job security and matlab it guarantees you a certain income even if it won't make you mega rich the second is vocation now even in the vocational part of it what can happen is you can get in there for idealistic reasons i want to help people i want to heal people i want to make people uh, better in all of those ways but it can soon get into routine and drudgery and hard work and all of that and that's also a risk and my experience really with any profession is that in literally every single profession you know except professions perhaps like the creative arts where people are more driven by passion or whatever but even there but in every single profession there'll be a very very large percentage of the people who are going through the motions they're ticking the boxes they're doing what they need to do but there is no deeper passion for example you could become a doctor but not really stay in touch with the latest in medicine not read the scientific literature not read the papers like one of my recent guests i was very impressed by known as liver doctor on twitter abby phillips you know does that every day ek ghanta baith ke he'll read the latest papers on the subject 
updated so he's really updated lancelot pinto who's been on the show does exactly that you know he'll keep himself up to date but 99% of doctors frankly don't you know their education is outdated and they don't know what the latest is so that passion isn't there in your case there is a lot of passion in terms of your keeping in stuff with the you keeping up to date with the latest stuff you've written a bunch of books you are involved in all these different kinds of organizations you are coming to india and doing seminars and helping people here as indeed you did during covid you're clearly involved but my impression is that just as in any other profession 95% of the people in your profession would just be going through the motions doing enough to get by and are not involved at that deep level maybe some of them and i'm not pointing it out as a weakness in character maybe the the, the job of a doctor is so difficult and demanding that you cannot give the time to you know get more involved than that so i understand that but what is your sense of this within the profession that are you an outlier in, uh, in that sense and um, you know and and does it does this kind of involvement like you are also bringing interdisciplinary lenses to bear like the physics that you pointed out where you are controlling the temperature of the oxygen cylinders depending on local conditions because you understand physics or you are looking at the history of medicine which i would imagine makes you so much more open to change and open to uh, a lot of stuff that is happening so what is your sense of this within the profession and do you have to make an intentional effort to be involved and to keep the idealism active okay now i am going to first uh, put out a disclaimer that this is not i, I have not worked in india for over 20 years so i don't know what the condition of medicine in india is currently except for uh, the colleagues that i keep in touch with who are who could possibly be outliers because they are very much in touch with what is going on in the uk you are subject to annual appraisal and you have to demonstrate that you have made an effort to attend you know to obtain a certain number of uh, professional development points each point is roughly an hour and you know stay in touch and professional growth so a- every year in addition to your pure professional pr- performance you have to demonstrate that you have attained continued professional development now i understand that in many states in india now the medical boards the registration bodies essentially now uh, ask for again a certain number of development hours every year and i think that is really useful now i would okay for 2 seconds i'll put aside humility and say yes i am an outlier cuz i'm <laughs> rather than someone who's the recipient of professional development i'm one of the people that develops the learning programs so yes i'm slightly an outlier uh, i write books i write lots of stuff i'm writing actually a non fiction book about intensive care um mm. uh, with patient and family consent which will hopefully come out next year but who knows <laughs> depends on how slow i write uh, you've read a couple of my stories you've never given me any positive feedback <laughs> cuz no no i i i was i, I was uh, <laughs> I, no, no. I, I, I was going to. I was going to give you positive feedback on uh, something you wrote about uh, your latest paper appearing into the soul. But I was going to save it later for the show. But uh, anyway, so we'll talk yeah. about it when yeah, that particular subject comes yeah, up. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, so that's. But I think that a lot of this is about self-reflection, and some of it is about regulation. so a lot of people a lot of medical professionals want to stay in touch with what is going on because they want to be 
better at what they do. Obviously, and it pains me, pains me to say this, some don't. So what you need is a regulatory pressure and medicine like law and finance and lots of other things is a heavily regulated profession. And um, I think that some people st try and stay in touch because it is so heavily regulated. Now, in some parts of the world, medicine isn't so highly regulated. So people actually just go with what they've what they learned 25 years ago rather than today. And the only way to make it happen uh, make it better, I should say, is to is through better regulation. And again, in India, some states regulate the medical profession better than others. And in answer to to to, to one of the things that the liver doctor says, I would argue that one of the ways of controlling violence against hospitals and doctors in India would be better regulation and easier, easier civil litigation. Because at the moment, if families are aggrieved, oh, sorry, Number one is better communication. And we will come to communication in a little bit. Uh, so communication and better regulation and better civil litigation. Because at the moment, people, if they feel that they have not been treated well in hospital, uh, resort to violence because they don't see any other alternatives. If they could see that there is other sorts of recourse, it, 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 it could probably be better to go that way. But who knows? I mean, this, this is just my personal opinion. However, sense with reg however sorry, sorry, uh, I can tell you that in 22 years in the UK, I faced... I've never ever faced even threat of violence because the system is so highly regulated that A, I can call the police or B, the patients or their families can call the police or go to the medical council rather than coming and beating me up or breaking windows. I think the greater threat our uh, friend, the liver doctor, Abby Phillips, faces is not so much from disgruntled patients. So he had one instance like that, but really more from many of the quacks that he calls out so courageously, the oh, uh, homeopaths man. and the Ayurvedic frauds and all of those kind of people. But, you know, just to sort of respond to the point on regulation, I would say that the problem in India, what tends to happen with it is that, number one, there is a massive rent-seeking mentality. So whoever the regulator is, it is likely that it will become a tool for seeking in their hands and it, they'll just be all around corruption any metrics that exist can easily be gamed and the second problem is that there will be regulatory capture vested interests will take over for example I had a very old episode on how uh, the with I think with Pavan Srinath on how the Medical Council of India at the time I think it'll change now but similar processes exist at the time would restrict the number of doctors in the country by you know determining what can qualify as a medical college and what can't and therefore artificially constraining the supply of med uh, medical education in the country and therefore artificially constraining the supply of doctors so that there is less competition which is a classic example of vested interest taking over the regulatory apparatus so uh, you know of the three things that you mentioned I am skeptical about regulation really helping given the state of India and given the way it is I am also skeptical about civil litigation working here given the state of our courts and how the process is often the punishment whether you're on the in the right or in the wrong 
what really does need to be made much better and this is where i want you to sort of elaborate and talk a little bit because you've been very eloquent on it in the past is better communication because one of the things that you know uh, one of the themes that you've spoken about is how we need to learn not only the science of medicine but also the art of medicine and the art of medicine involves how do you communicate a with your patients and b with the patients relatives so that you can help all of them come to informed decisions that are made together and this obviously means there is no rancor later once they understand exactly what has gone wrong once they understand you know what are the probabilities involved and so on and so forth and abby's episode of course has a lot about this lance also talks about this and the complication that it seems to me here that i'd also like you to address is that there is a trade off that by not giving much time to the patients but just by using you know what economists call fast and frugal heuristics you can actually get through more patients and therefore serve more people but the level of service per patient would be much less or you can spend a lot of time with each patient but that way you get to see less patients and therefore you know there are more people who are going untreated but the level of service that you're giving to your patients is higher by talking to them individually because even many busy doctors will say ki are i have 80 patients in a day i can't sit and chat with all of them and I explain the details to all of them so you know i i i take a more efficient way out so what are these trade offs like and how do doctors kind of navigate them and tell me also about this that better communication aspect like is this something you knew all along or is it that you learned during your journey of becoming a good doctor okay i don't know if i'm a good doctor um you would have to ask, ask my patients the second is aur yahan pe main aapka sirf 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 mazak kar raha hu theek hai but uh, fewer patients not less patients are sir bengali mother punjabi father kindly excuse hum bhi galtiyan karte hain theek hai so what i would say is that i am in as opposed to the, the 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 two doctors that you have interviewed previously so dr pinto and the liver doctor i am in a very 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 privileged position they have perhaps 10 minutes 15 minutes to spend with every patient possibly 10 minutes in my case i work in intensive care and the uk intensive care society where i helped to write the standards the rule is that you have a consultant and a junior doctor for every 10 to 12 patients so in a 10 hour shift i have one hour or perhaps you know 30 minutes to spend with the patient and 20 30 minutes to spend with the relatives and actually what happens is that for instance my icu is one of the biggest icus in europe actually it was the biggest icu in the world when it was built 15 years ago but obviously other icus have been built since then and what we do is because my patients cannot talk to me because i'm in intensive care which is again different from a lot of other patients other other specialties my my patients cannot talk to me so we talk to families and typically we only talk to about 30% of families kyu is the okay for instance jaise in one of my so i work in across three icus in one of my icus we have 2500 admissions a year 2500 admissions every year of that 2500 admissions approximately 12 to 1500 basically covid mein thoda kam ho gaya tha to isliye i'm saying 12 to 1500 basically it used to be 1500 are post surgical patients so किसी का लंग रिसेक्शन हुआ है किसी का कोई सर्जरी हुआ है नाइन्टी नाइन परसेंट ऑफ देम आर गोइंग टू सर्वाइव एंड दे आर गोइंग टू बी आउट ऑफ इंटेंसिव केयर विद इन फोर्टी एट आवर्स 
तो आई डोंट नीड टू सिट एंड कम्युनिकेट विद द फैमिली जो वी हैव वन टू वन नर्सिंग बेड साइड नर्स ने जूनियर डॉक्टर ने किसी ने बोल दिया कि सब कुछ ठीक चल रहा है हम डिस्चार्ज कर देंगे कल तो हाँ नहीं खत्म सो यू डोंट दिस नॉट अज अमाउंट ऑफ कम्युनिकेशन ही डिट द एंड वॉट हैपन्स इज यू डोंट इवन रिमेंबर दो पेशेंट्स नेम्स बिकॉज दे ओनली स्टेड यू विद यू फॉर ट्वेंटी फोर और थर्टी सिक्स आवर्स और फोर्टी एट आवर्स वॉट हैपन्स इज we still have a 20 to 25% mortality in our intensive care and that is the other 40% of patients of whom half will die and they are the ones that are going to stay in our icu for 4 5 6 20 days whatever and they are the ones where you need to manage communication with families where you need to manage expectations where you need to talk about how there is essentially more than 50% chance of their family member dying and one of the things that i have noticed which is different between icus in india and icus abroad is visiting and communication the treatment i mean the technical features of treatment honestly i can tell you i have visited lots of icus in india and it is n- absolutely not worse than european or american icus however however it's the visiting and communication that is the problem we have 24/7 visiting in icu so two pay, two two family members per bed per patient they can be there 24/7 we actually have four rooms for relatives that are you know who can't afford staying in a hotel or something so we have four rooms actually in the hospital four ensuite rooms in the hospital and we had a charity drive recently a few years ago to update those rooms so we have rooms in the hospital for people who can't afford to stay in a nearby hotel or something or who don't live nearby because most most of our population lives nearby anyway so it is and 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 we allow 24/7 visiting we are very open we cuz i i think um, part of the reason is cuz there's no financial incentive i don't care if 90% of my icu beds are full or only 50% of my icu beds are full so i will be open and honest with all of my patients or prospective patients and their families that this is where we are going and this is the likely prognosis and then we talk very 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 openly about end of life care which i think is the third thing that is different from what my colleagues tend to do in india and and this is not a secret this is uh, I've, i've 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 talked it about it extensively at various conferences in india in that in india the the the, the tendency is to hide bad prognosis why probably because of commercial reasons i am not blaming anyone i'm just stating the reality it's commercial reasons because if you say this person is likely to die in the next few days 
and the family will take them to another hospital uh, who will you know or another person who will promise or give hope of a better prognosis does that make any sense yeah yeah absolutely and i was going to in fact ask uh, ask you to double down on that next when uh, you know because i'm very curious in the ways in which the incentives for indian doctors seem to differ from the incentives for doctors elsewhere like you've pointed out your incentives would not be about keeping the ward full or keeping as many you know, you know customers as such you can look at them as patients and human beings and not as customers <laughs> but in indian hospitals what one hears about is one hears about horror stories of how doctors are incentivized ki aap jitne test karwaoge each test se aapko cut milega you know and you have to guarantee a certain revenue new to the hospital you are with and therefore that incentivizes you to not be completely honest with the patient to make them do more tests that, than is required to make them you know and and one of the great tragedies is i forget the number you will know the number but a significant chunk of people savings are actually spent in their last year of life or the last few months of life when actually there is no hope anyway and and, and they might as well not do it and leave the money let for the family and let me figure, figure out a peaceful way to go we will talk about that Okay. we will talk about that uh, yeah finance acha maine likh liya aapne likh liya no so so we'll talk about that in a bit so uh, tell me a bit about the about how these incentives differ and how can they be uh, fixed because one obvious way in which they could be fixed is that indian hospitals would simply stop these sort of extortionary practices if there was much more competition because then they would have to compete with each other to give good honest treatment and you wouldn't have this situation but you have this situation because they can get away with it and there's not enough competition and that's just a much deeper problem and it's a policy problem and i won't ask you to elaborate on that but just in terms of okay. incentives like where do you what would you have been a different kind of doctor if you were in india yes and yes okay so i will start off with i am not a uh, healthcare a public healthcare policy specialist so that is my disclaimer <laughs> however i have thought a lot about this and remember when you look at say pure research saying okay what's the best 10 healthcare systems in the world they are all socialized healthcare so unlike many areas of public policy healthcare is one of those systems which seems to actually work better when it is socialized and i i i i i, I am sorry that this is this is the one thing that i disagree with you on where the market does not work Well, you don't actually disagree with me because if you, uh, as you would have figured from my episode on healthcare with Karthik Murli Tharoor and others, my point is not that it should not be socialized. My point is you also let the private players operate yeah. and let that play out, and and, and uh, you, you know, and and that make that part of it ha- doesn't really happen here. Yeah, but, sure. uh, but hmm. what you need is okay. I'm going to switch to Hindi. Hmm. Um, मेरे साढ़े पांच साल के मेडिकल स्कूल में So in five and a half years of medical school, do you know how much time was spent on ethics? My guess is zero. Five hours. Five hours. Okay. यहाँ पे and how much time was spent on biochemistry, which I have never used in my life? Um, <laughs> a lot more. <laughs> basically 2 hours every day for 1 and 1/2 years to kitne ho gaye 800 hours 900 hours something okay you are right your math is good ha huh? carry on <laughs> and um how much time was spent on how to communicate with patients zero ek minute bhi nahi hame sikhaya gaya how to communicate with patients kyun क्योंकि हमारा जो मेडिकल एजुकेशन सिस्टम है वो 1850 से चल रहा है सो so, 
what we need is we need to get a lot better at communicating with patients things like biochemistry basic sciences all of that can be learned later but what you need to do primarily and as soon as possible is professionalism and professionalism is being honest and communicating well with your patients and your families so let me butt in here i'll come back to my incentives question later but while you're on the subject of communicating better tell me a bit about your journey in learning how to communicate because you said ki medical school mein to zero hours se but then over the course of your practice you must have learned you you must have messed things up you must have got things wrong you must have learned from them you must have figured out first principles you must have figured out best practices take me through that journey of yours right that is a really interesting question so i think one of the major problems with communication that i had in my early years was ke bhai dekho india mein main kaam kar raha tha sarkari hospital mein for a long time theek hai uske baad charitable hospital mein to it was a case of ke acha hum upper caste even though I never thought about caste, but when I think back, it is a question of privilege, isn't it? And you would agree with that. Okay, upper middle class, upper caste, so higher social economic status. So patient, who is the patient, is you do not consider your patients unless you are in a corporate. upper class hospital you do not consider the patient as an equal human being to yourself and that means that you do not communicate with the patient as an equal human being and i think that happens in a lot of professions would you agree Yeah yeah absolutely and absolutely so if you do not see the patient as an equal human being to yourself then you are going to treat them as essentially a lesser person their families as even lesser people so you are going to be a rude dismissive and possibly even and i uh, i i regret to say this possibly even less than truthful especially with the economic incentives involved whereas what i learned over time was especially after me my wife my parents have suffered various illnesses over time is that it is so much better to respect your patients and their families and to be very honest with them so if someone's going to if someone is unlikely to survive why hide it and it is much easier i will admit in the health system i work in because it's not like they will move the patient to another icu where someone will promise that oh no 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 we will try our best to save this patient so it is it is much easier for me to communicate honestly with people whereas i know in india even my own relatives they've had this experience where ke acha ek hospital mein kisi ne bol diya ke acha ye iska cancer jo hai ye end stage pe hai and then someone else says ke acha nahi 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 hum hum kar denge <laughs> hum kuch karenge aur kuch karenge <laughs> and they go there and they spend end up spending tens of lakhs of rupees on 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 that which is non evidence based treatment but 
it happens. And there is realistically no way around it. So communication with families and honest communication, because my communication tends to be um, unlike your previous medical interviews. So Lawrence and the liver doctor. My, Lancelot. Lancelot. Sorry, 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 sorry. Dr. Pinto. Dr. Pinto. And I am going to apologize to Dr. Pinto in five minutes through text. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, So, so through your previous medical interviews, their communication tends to be with patients and they tend to see a lot of patients every day. I only see, I'll be very honest, I only see 10 to 15 patients a day. But I spend a lot of time with them because I work in intensive care. During COVID, I saw twice, thrice, possibly four times as many every day. And that caused me a lot of trouble. But we, 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 we talk to families. We spend as much time talking to families as we do with the patients. And we, we are completely honest as a unit. We tell them exactly, you know, your... Okay, let's take an example. Your um, dad has pneumonia. He is 78. He has diabetes and hypertension and he's had... A heart attack before his chances of survival are probably 20% at the moment so basically you need to be prepared that he's going to die and if he survives that's great we would be extremely happy but the 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 the, the chance of mortality here is about 80%. We would never lie about that. We would never try to sugarcoat that because we do not have a commercial motive here. And I agree that that goes against and I, I count myself as a a libertarian and that actually goes against market theory but I would argue that there are some things some sectors that should be against market theory well, I mean, that's a discussion for another day and we'll save it for later. But <laughs> I think the market often can set great incentives. So, uh, you know, I- India is a really bad example and it's not even a completely free market in that sense. And there are so many things wrong with it, which is just a whole different policy story. But I want to sort of come back to this question of talking to patients and talking to the relatives also. Like one is that we have this instinctive sort of de- uh, denial of our mortality built into us, right? I mean, in that sense, a mortality rate for all of us is 100% given a long enough span of time. But we tend to be in, we tend to live as if we are in denial of it. And secondly, when you speak about, like, if you were to ever be my doctor and tell me about my chances, I would want you to do it exactly as you just mentioned, where you give me the probabilities and then you break it down in more granular detail. But most people can't grok probabilistic thinking. You know, they can't feel figure out what you mean that, okay, your chances of survival to more than five years are 11%, more than 10 years are 3%, three years is, you know, 24%, and there's a 60% chances over in three months. Most people can't grok that. They can't figure it out. What do we do with it? So, you know, what are the kind of responses that you get from both patients and relatives? Is there a situation where you decide that the patient may not be able to take it? So you have to tell the relative alone, which is a judgment liver doctor, Abby Phillips mentioned that he 
he has made sometimes that is better to talk to the relatives and keep the patient out of the loop and i felt a little uncomfortable at that because i think that you it just feels that you always have to be upfront and honest with the patient so what are your sort of personal experiences in this which have shaped the way that you think about this have you had any really difficult moments lots and lots of really difficult moments and i would actually i mean okay i i i work in a different country from dr philips so i will definitely not even try to criticize what he said okay however what i would say is and of course i work in intensive care however hiding things from the patient is something that is expressly against uk law as long as the patient has capacity you never ever hide anything from the patient if the patient does not have the mental capacity to take their own decisions then it's different but as long as the patient has the mental capacity to take their own decisions you never ever 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 have the legal authority to hide anything from the patient so that is one thing that is expressly forbidden actually in most of europe and in most of north america as well and actually i do not think that there has ever been i i i am not sure that there's ever been judicial recognition of hiding things from patients who have capacity in india it is just that our courts often give vague decisions and after 30 years so uh, they amount to nothing How, however i would argue that if a patient has capacity so if they have mental capacity to make decisions so if they can say i do not want to go to intensive care i do not want chemotherapy they are the only people that get to make the decision and hiding a diagnosis and i texted the liver doctor this morning to apologize for criticizing but if a patient has capacity hiding a diagnosis from a patient is technically a criminal offense in this country i anyway. you know i just want to add to that like firstly forget criminal offense i think it is wrong i think you should always let patients know exactly what the scene is and there should be complete honesty as long as they're not in completely incapacitated i agree with you but i also want to for those of my listeners who haven't heard my episode with abby just give a little bit of context there because he was talking about complicated situations where for example patients would come to him with severe liver cirrhosis they were from lower income families they were definitely going to die within 3 months 4 months whatever and a liver transplant surgery say would cost 20 lakhs and the family only has 10 uh, lakhs uh, uh, and if they and if they get an extreme debt to kind of fund it then he's going to die anyway and they're going to be in severe debt so all he would do is really sit with the family and explain the implications and then let the family take a call so i am not for that i would always tell the patient because i feel that's just what you have to do so i'm with you on that but it is not as if he is do- he is facing a very difficult moral dilemma and be- because i'm not in his shoes i don't you know i i totally understand where he's coming from i just wanted to clarify that for my listeners and i would completely agree with abby and i am going to apologize on <laughs> on, on your life on on your podcast it is a question of well it 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 is a ma- multifactorial thing isn't it yeah. depends on okay are you in a socialized medical system or are you in a system where a small chance of survival could mean financial ruin for your family 
And they are two very different things, aren't they? Exactly. So deeply complicated for that reason. Yeah. Which is why I, I always say that I am very, very hesitant to compare different medical systems because a socialized medical system versus a semi-socialized medical system like in, I mean, half of America is semi-socialized medical system. And a an almost completely non-socialized medical system like in India. They are three very different things. And again, in India, we have a, we have a medical system that is uh, very different between socio-economic classes. And that is very different from anywhere in the developed world, isn't it? I'm sure you'd agree with that. No, no, absolutely. And also there is, I think, the added complication, and I'm just thinking aloud of other kinds of tri triaging dilemmas that can come up. Like, let's say, in a situation like this, which is not socialized, you have a... a f you know, you have a desperately poor family, maybe they have 10 lakhs of saving and operation will take 20 lakhs with 0% chance of saving this person. So the decision seems pretty straightforward that just don't do it, don't bother, right? But I can imagine that even in a completely socialized system, there is a number at which it falls apart. For example, let's say somebody has a 0.5% chance of survival. How much of will course. you spend to save that person? Let, let me course. finish. How much How much would you spend to save that person? You would say $10,000? Of course. $100,000? Let's think about it. $10 million? No, because then there's an opportunity cost on other situations as well. So, you know, those Absolutely. kind of triaging decisions would also come into play, right? Absolutely. And in the UK, there's an organization called NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which basically puts a value and someone would, I'm sure there's someone in the world that would say this is unethical, but they put a value on human life. So they put a value in qualities. So that is quality added life years. So not just survival life years, quality added life years. And they put a numerical value on it. Uh, it varies from year to year with inflation and something. A few years ago, it was 35,000 pounds per year. So basically, if spending 350,000 pounds on someone would add 10 good quality years, so not just years in a wheelchair or a bed, 10, 10 good quality years to their life, then it would be worth it. So that is how essentially socialized medicine would work. And if it added nine, if it added nine years, would the treatment be turned down? Maybe, maybe not. So, so basically, there's sort of green zones, amber zones, and red zones. <laughs> so, it's it's hard. And you, you will remember that in America, they called these death panels. Mm -hmm. These committees were called death panels. Whereas they are actually life panels. What you're deciding is, okay, this person cannot afford this treatment privately. So, can the state afford to provide this treatment? And it's hard. You have to pick a metric. And the metric most of Europe has picked is quality. So, quality added life years. And if you look at the best healthcare in the world for the general population, I think most of the top 10 are in Europe, aren't they? 
I would completely agree that the top 1% in America get better health care. There is absolutely no doubt about it. But the other 99% get worse health care than in most of Europe. And it's the same in India. When there are great hospitals in India, I know a lot of fantastic doctors in India. However, the system is rigged against them. So, sorry, we got off the topic. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd say, I'd say, look, in an ideal world to avoid these kind of dilemmas and these decisions taken by life panels, as you would call them, is for healthcare to be affordable and people to be prosperous so people can make their own choices. And both of those, affordable healthcare and prosperous people, can only be delivered by markets. Absolutely. So, you know, okay, I, I, I will, I will totally, <laughs> yeah. totally, totally agree with you that a free market is the way I, I i am a libertarian and i will agree that free no, i don't, I don't even know to go. free markets are the way to go yes no no i i i i wasn't even getting into that discussion and instead <laughs> i was leading into a break that you know we should get back to talking about your personal journey and i'm especially fascinated by knowing much more about the history of intensive care and your experiences in that and you are of course i would say one of the world experts in that having written so many books and holding the positions you do in britain but let's take a quick commercial break and then we'll come back and we'll resume talking about your life and your fascinating journey Have you always wanted to be a writer but never quite gotten down to it? Well, I'd love to help you. Since April 2020, I've enjoyed teaching 27 cohorts of my online course, The Art of Clear Writing, and an online community has now sprung up of all my past students. We have workshops, a newsletter to showcase the work of students, and vibrant community interaction. In the course itself, through four webinars spread over four weekends, I share all I know about the craft and practice of clear writing. There are many exercises, much interaction, and a lovely and lively community at the end of it. The course costs rupees 10,000 plus GST or about $150. If you're interested, head on over to register at indiauncut.com slash clear writing. That's indiauncut.com slash clear writing. Being a good writer doesn't require God-given talent, just a willingness to work hard and a clear idea of what you need to do to refine your skills. I can help you. Welcome back to The Scene and the Unseen. I'm chatting with my good friend Nitin Arora, uh, the good doc who's been telling us all about his life and the medical profession and uh, so on and so forth. And Nitin, so I want to now, you know, move on to talking about intensive care, particularly like, you know, break ke pehle incentive tha, bhi intensive ho gaya. And, and uh, tell me a little bit about this field, which is actually uh, sort of a relatively new part of the medical profession. I mean, till the middle of the century, it didn't really exist. And then it, it you know, it kind of uh, came on for a while in, in response to you know, a particular uh, local challenge of polio when you had heart-lung machines and so on. And then it again in the 1980s, it got revived because of uh, heart disease and all of that. So take me a bit th th take me through the history of intensive care, which also seems to me to be a particularly sort of almost moving in a different direction for from the rest of medicine in the in the limited sense that while the rest of the medical field is seen hyper specialization where every specialist is dealing with a particular kind of disease and a particular kind of uh, patient and so on and so forth oh, you guys are like generalists you have to know everything you have to do everything and you have to deal with everything in its most acute form so you know to, if I may sort of provoke the historian in you, and I know you're writing a book on this and I can't wait to read it, but give me a potted history of intensive care. Okay, <laughs> so, so basically, yeah, as you said, intensive care developed during a polio epidemic in the 1950s, where patients who had severe polio, who couldn't breathe for themselves, they were put on heart-lung machines and in intensive care and uh, some of them still survive and one of my very good friends matt morgan has actually written a book about the history of intensive care and I i'll send you a link which you can put in the show notes so it is a relatively new specialty and again as you said, in the 60s and 70s, once the polio vaccine 
came in. Intensive care declined in its uh, importance. And then again, in the late 70s, when we started doing lots of heart surgery, intensive care came back, essentially. And then when we recognized that a large number of people were dying of sepsis in the 80s, Uh, So infectious diseases, sepsis, respiratory failure. So intensive care came back. And from then on, intensive care has been on an increasing journey. And from basically, you know, less than 1% of hospital beds, uh, slowly, slowly we found that currently about 4% of hospital beds, 4 to 5% of hospital beds in the UK, about 6% in the EU and about 10%, even though they define it slightly differently, in the US of hospital beds are intensive care beds, some sort of intensive care beds. And in America, about 70% of hospital deaths happen in intensive care. Because everyone gets admitted to intensive care at some point. In the UK and in most of Europe, what you find is, if you go and see a patient, you have, because there's, again, we come back to the difference between commercial and socialized medicine. (laughs) So if you go and see someone and you see that they are, almost certainly going to die in spite of whatever you do in intensive care. You just say no, because there's no commercial reasons involved. That's putting it very gently. So it is, yeah, so it's, 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 it's been a long, complicated history. However, intensive care came into public light really during COVID. Before COVID, no one gave a shit about intensive care. During COVID, suddenly we found, oh, yeah, intensive care exists. And actually, I am slightly, extremely sorry for my (laughs) emergency medicine and general medicine colleagues that dealt with more COVID patients than we did. But they somehow did not get the media recognition that intensive care did. And yes, it was an extremely stressful time for intensive care. What we had was we quadrupled our numbers. So my uh, my ICU grew by four times. At times, we and, and, and we had to transfer patients to other hospitals when we ran out of capacity with the same number of consultants but this at this point we were resident there 24 7 so we were working twice as hard we were looking after four times as many patients our anesthetic and medical colleagues did their best to help us and what we had was my icu normally has a mortality rate of about 20 percent So you increase my ICU by four times and then you have a mortality rate of 40% in COVID ICU. So that's an eight times increase in absolute deaths. Yep. What does that do to your colleagues' mental health? So... We started the pandemic with 18 ICU consultants. We finished the pandemic with three who retired early, one who went to Dubai, and two that, no, yeah, two, two that decided to leave intensive care. And of the other 12, Five have been at various times 
been on sick leave with mental health, essentially burnout problems. Including you. Including me. And I am currently off work. Again, because of burnout. And uh, so it's, it's, it's been an extremely difficult time for all of us. And it's, it's, it's the numbers for our ICU nurses are again very similar. So it's, it's, it, it has been an extremely difficult time. Can I, can I tell you why, what the biggest thing for me was? Tell me. I was, I, I, I will later tell you some funnier stories as well, as well. And let me say, for clarity, this is all with patient or next of, in, next of kin consent. So, during COVID, as you can imagine, normally we have 24-7 visiting so patients families can be there all the time except when we you know request them to leave if you're doing procedures or something or if they have to go to scans or stuff but normally we just have 24 7 visiting for families during covid visiting was suspended and actually even if visiting had been allowed a lot of family members themselves had COVID. And so they could, couldn't possibly be allowed to visit anyway. I was on a night shift and I came in at nine o'clock. At about half ten, uh, the nurse in charge talks to me and says, there's this guy who's called three times today and he has COVID himself and I think he is confused and possibly needs to come into hospital. So I was like, okay, what is he confused about? And I am told that this guy is constantly ringing to ask about his wife. his wife, who was in our intensive care with COVID. And obviously this guy has COVID as well, so he can't visit. And uh, his wife died two days ago. And somehow with the pressure of numbers, sh dying at shift change time, no one told him. For months, I had nightmares that my wife had been admitted to intensive care and died. And no one told me for two days. It is so far below the standards that we would set for my intensive care or any intensive care for that matter, that it affected me hugely. But... Did you tell that guy? Yes. I ended up having a one-hour discussion, a one-hour talk with that man. And then I ended up talking at midnight to our hospital's uh, legal advisor as well. Because he threatened to sue? No, he didn't. He yeah. was actually so nice that I almost cried at how nice this guy was. But because the hospital, you know, has legal liability and so I had to talk to the executive on call, the one of the executive directors, and I had to call uh, speak to the 
to, 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 to the legal team. But actually, this guy did nothing. He came and he was like very, very, very understanding. Of course, for the first 10 minutes, he swore at me and said all sorts of things. But again, communication is about apologizing sometimes. And sometimes, even if it's not your fault, it's your team that missed something and you end up apologizing for everyone on everyone's behalf. So I apologized profusely on behalf of the whole intensive care team. And actually, the, the, the next day, the guy came in to collect the death certificate and he spoke to one of my colleagues and he was absolutely fine. Uh, so it it wasn't like he threatened to sue. He didn't. He was very understanding that this was essentially a a whole healthcare system crisis, if that makes any sense. Tell me something. I, I'll come back to intensive care. I'll come back to this narrative. But brief digression. That and it's always fascinated me about doctors that at one level, the people you're seeing are people. They're all different from each other. They're real flesh and blood people with feelings, with emotions, with fears, with insecurities, and so on and so forth. At another level, they are objects for you to, you know, use your craft on to make them better. You know, they have bodies, you have to be, in a certain sense, clinical, which is such a cold term, but you have to be coldly clinical in figuring out what's wrong with them and helping through, uh, them through that. And in this second aspect, when a death happens, a death happens. Probably, probabilistically, people you are looking after will die. In your case, because you're in intensive care, many more uh, than other doctors may uh, uh, face. And you also spend a lot of time with each of your patients and their families, so you get to know them. How does one manage that trade-off? Like at the one hand, to be able to do your job properly, I am guessing that you have to be emotionally a little detached and just look at the problem on hand, which is what is going on in their body. But on the other hand, can you really fully do that? I mean, it. you mentioned this one traumatic incident, but I'd imagine that trauma visits daily where you are. How does one deal with that? What are the kind of defenses you build up? And that is a really, really interesting question. And that is a question that we deal with every, every single day. So when I was a medical student and a junior doctor, we were told or we were taught or we were actually inadvertently taught because no one expressly no one expressed this. No one talked about this. It was like, patients are subhuman. They don't exist. They are just there. So you just emotionally detach yourself. They are not human. As I grew up, essentially, patients became human. And then what I found was and this is what I tell all of my trainees, medical students, everyone. And this is what, what, what modern medical practice would look like. Is that, yes, patients are human. If one of your patients dies and you are sad about it, it is okay to feel sad. It is okay to feel the emotion. It is okay that you are disappointed, you are sad, you are angry, you have grief because if you are actually not in touch with your emotions, it is, it is hard to be a good doctor. And this is something that I believe that our previous generation of teachers, of medical teachers, got wrong. Where they believed that you had to be completely emotionally detached from your patients. Personally, I'll tell you, when, when, I'm, an, when I'm, on, I'm on intensive care, I speak to four, five, six families every day. 
Some of it is good news, some of it is bad news. I cry personally once or twice every day that I am on intensive care. I know that our nursing staff cry regularly with the families. And that actually is healthy. It is giving expression to your emotions rather than bottling it in. And I think that is one of the problems that caused my current burnout, which is that during COVID, uh, because we didn't have families visiting, you couldn't sit and talk to the families. So the first thing I normally do when I talk to families is I ask them, okay, so what was, so, 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 you know, your relative, your dad, your son, your uncle, whoever, or your mom or your aunt, what were they like? Tell me a little bit about them. What did they like doing? What did they enjoy doing? What were their hobbies? How was their relationship with the family? What it does is it humanizes the patient for me. And once it humanizes, well, okay, and somewhat selfishly, it also forms a rapport and a connection with the family. <laughs> but it, it humanizes the patient for me. And it tells the family that I am actually, I, I actually, how do I put this nicely? I actually give a shit. <laughs> that this is not just bed number nine. This is Mr. Qureshi. And I believe that makes a huge, huge difference. Making, making sure that the family know that this is not bed number nine. This is Mr. Qureshi. And you know that, okay, uh, he, he likes to, you know, go for golf or go jogging in the morning and, you know, loves his dog, whatever. It is because I can't talk to my patients. My patients are sedated. They are on a ventilator. So how do I make sure that they are not just slabs of meat lying on a bed? I have to humanize them somehow. And, and, and th this is not just me. This is, this is all of my colleagues. We all try and do this. And yeah, that's, that's how you try and humanize people. The problem with that is once you humanize people, you develop an emotional connection with them. <laughs> and basically, I said we have normally a 20% mortality rate in ICU. But actually, the other 80% or 60-70%, they come to ICU, they stay for one day or two days. You never talk to the family because or you talk to the family for two minutes at the bedside and you just say, yeah, he's doing very well. We will move him or her to the ward later today and they'll get discharged from the hospital in three days. The only people you remember are the ones where you've spoken to the family seven times and you have basically gone through the various stages of grief yourself as well as the family has. So you've gone through and, and, and you've experienced the family stages of grief, you know, about denial, about anger, about shouting at you. And you've, you've absorbed all of that. That takes a huge amount of emotional energy. And you have to be, yeah, 
very mentally strong as an intensivist but yeah sometimes you come you 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 reach your limit and which is why as i said i am currently off work you said earlier that you believe that if you're not in touch with your emotions it's hard for you to be a good doctor and i i i love this humanizing process and i can see how it helps you in terms of connecting with the relatives of the family and helping them to come to terms with what is going on and reassuring them that it's not bed number 9 it's mr kureshi but does it also help you in your actual practice being able to humanize this person because i would imagine at one level a doctor could easily say that okay there is a lung infection these are the medicines i have to g- g- get to give it out of you know out of the way these are the vitals i need to keep an eye on and that's it and then if you keep your emotions out of it it's much easier on you to actually treat them as a slab of meat so does knowing those little aspects of their personality actually help you better treat a person who is anyway serrated and can't really converse with you in any case yes and this is where we come to what what we started with so a few months ago we had a whatsapp conversation about end of life care and that is where you and i agreed to have a, a podcast and so far we've just talked about intensive care and me and we're just we, getting started we're yeah, just getting started yeah yeah, yeah. so this end is, of life can come at the end of podcast yeah, yeah, no, 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 no i'm no. kidding but this this mm. this this is the key so humanizing people also includes knowing what they are like what they enjoy what they would want so if six members of the family and actually i'll come back to this one in a minute but okay if six members of the family together tell me that dad would dad was you know an army officer and discharged from intensive care in a wheelchair and you know being having to be having to have 24/7 nursing care including toilet care would be extremely degrading and would would be basically unacceptable to dad then that has to play a part in where you go but can you spell that out for me okay let's start again so i go to see a patient on the ward who someone has said could probably need intensive care so i go to the ward i talk to the patient the patient in their 70s 80s whatever they need to have a leg amputated because they are basically they've got a major infection and then after that they are going to need to come to intensive care to be ventilated i go see the patient ask the patient okay look you're going to have a leg amputated then you're going to come to intensive care your chances of survival are whatever percent and then after intensive care you will very probably need you know 6 8 10 months of intensive physiotherapy and you will probably still be for life confined to a wheelchair many of my patients will at that point say actually i do not want this operation just keep me that, com- that, just keep me comfortable that, 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 does that mean they die they've chosen to die yeah just keep me comfortable i don't want to go through all this pain and with a really poor quality of life and sometimes i have to make that decision i have to tell the patient 
that actually your chances of survival are so low. And this is where we come back to the the Trumpian trope about Trumpian death trope. Panels. Yeah, death panels. Sorry, I just got lost in the Trumpian trope because that that that, so was, one, that sounded so good. <laughs> it's a wonderful alliteration. Yes, yeah. So, so, so to to to, to, to about, about the death panels, where basically I decide, or you know, the intensive care consultant decides who gets admitted to intensive care, just like a cardiac surgeon decides who they will operate on. So. If I think that the patient has very, very little chance of survival or uh, in after discussion with the patient, when, if they have a very poor chance of survival, then I have to say, no, I will not admit you to intensive care. How poor is very poor? Like what would qualify? Oh, it's really hard. But basically, anyone that comes to intensive care leaves worse than their baseline. So if you have someone who is, say, in a nursing home needing assistance with um, daily toilet facilities, they are not coming to intensive care. What happens when you tell them? Like, what 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 experiences have you had? Oh, um, actually, most because to say no is to, to to but to say no is to condemn them to death, right? Immediately, and they know it. To ye- to say yes is to condemn them to a protracted death. So what you're going to do is basically one option is you're saying okay. I am really sorry, but there is nothing we can do for you. So it's like a stage four cancer patient where a surgeon says, there's nothing more we can do for you. So basically, we'll just give you painkillers and keep you comfortable. The other is to subject them to a variety of painful procedures and torture them and their families. And then they're going to die anyway. So what would you rather have? A few hours or a few days in comfort with, without pain, with the presence of your family or essentially be subject to medical procedures that are not really going to help you or are very, very unlikely to help you. And then die sedated, possibly in pain and possibly without your family around you. What would you prefer? No, I mean, are you asking me? I thought it's a rhetorical question. No, I would. That's I, I not would, a rhetorical course, question. I'm asking. That's a real question. No, no, no. <laughs> I would. I would, of course, and people can note this as my uh, wishes. If something like that were ever to happen, that I would just prefer to go peacefully and not, uh, you know, prolong yeah. it unnecessarily. Exactly. And so on and so forth. And, mm. and remember, the four pillars of medical ethics. They are the first one is non malfeasance, which is often described as, first of all, do no harm. Okay? So, if I am admitting a patient to intensive care and subjecting them to lots of procedures where it is unlikely to do them any good, then I'm doing harm. Okay. The second one is beneficence. So, that is, try and help people. So, If I think that whatever I do is not going to help people, then I don't admit them. The third one is called autonomy. So the patient gets autonomy. So if a patient says, I do not want resuscitation or I do not want to go to ICU or I do not want cancer treatment, 
then they get to decide. You cannot force treatment on a patient. That, that would be legally criminal assault. And the fourth one is justice. Now, justice is the hardest one, in, especially in a socialized healthcare system. So, you have one ICU bed left in the whole region. So, inside your whole transfer region, because normally if we are full, we can transfer patients out to other ICUs within our region. You have a 23-year-old with a stab wound and you have an 85-year-old with a heart attack. Who do you admit? You have one bed left. I don't know the right answer. I've been doing this for over 25 years. I still do not know what the right answer is. The fourth pillar of medical ethics is justice. And I still do not know. So what I do, what I would do is I would try my hardest to admit everyone that has a realistic chance of survival. If they do not have a realistic chance of survival, then the fourth pillar, justice, would say that the patient with the that if you're in a crisis, if you do not have enough resources, the patient with the highest probability of survival is the one that gets to intensive care. And we did that during COVID. We've done that previously during POM blasts. And that is classic military triage. So you basically look at people and see who is likely to survive, who is extremely unlikely to survive. And I, I'll probably get a lot of social media criticism for this, but basically, if you're extremely unlikely to survive, then, and, and we have a crisis of resources, then we should not be You have to use into, our limit. Yeah, we have to uh, use our limited yeah. uh, resources How, the best. However, we can, yeah. however, as one of my colleagues taught me or corrected me when I said this many many years ago, about fifteen years ago, he said, "You can say we will stop active treatment." What you never, ever, ever can do is to stop care. So people say, we will stop care. And you can never stop care. Actually, what you do is, you increase care for that patient. When you know that the patient's going to die, you do not, you stop active treatment. So you can stop treatment, but you can definitely, yeah. So we, we try very hard not to triage, but sometimes it is inevitable. The unfortunate reality is when you say to someone on the ward, to a patient or their family, that you are not going to admit them to intensive care, it is essentially a death sentence. You're telling them that you're going to try very hard to keep them comfortable on the ward, but because uh, we have what we call an intensive care outreach service, so our nurses will go and see them and we have palliative care. So we, we try our best to keep the patients pain-free and comfortable, but they are going to die. Now, if you ask the population whether they would have what would be essentially a futile 
painful medical procedure or die comfortably. My understanding is from published research that most people would actually say they would like to die pain-free, ideally at home, surrounded by family and friends, rather than be subject to unnecessary medical procedures. However, that doesn't always happen. And the reasons why it doesn't always happen tends to be but it, 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 it t- t- tends to be multiple reasons. The Americans call it the cousin from California. Have you heard that phrase before? No, no, no. No, no. Okay. So basically it is daddy is admitted in intensive care. All organs are failing. We are talking about stopping treatment or at least putting in a do not resuscitate order. And uh, a cousin from California or, you know, someone who basically hasn't seen one of the children that hasn't seen daddy in 20 years, but is now guilt ridden over that, comes in and starts objecting about it. And then you have to go over the whole reality of CPR. What is CPR? CPR is when we basically insert a breathing tube into the patient and start compressing their chest. Now, for a young patient with who's otherwise healthy, CPR is great. It works. For someone who already has respiratory, cardiac and renal failure, all it is going to do is it is going to do it is going to break ribs when you compress the chest and essentially basically it is torturing your patient to death and sometimes it can be very hard to persuade di- distant relatives or relatives that have not been in touch recently but are now guilt-ridden so it can be very difficult and until recently in india you could not actually say do not try to resuscitate or do not do cpr so until about three years ago in india you could not request that as a family or as a patient. So my mother-in-law, she was admitted in an intensive care unit with sepsis, pneumonia, UTI, lots of, lot, lots of problems, multi-organ failure essentially. And she was on 100% oxygen, on dialysis, nothing was working. And I I have my wife's permission to disclose this one. So we actually requested, I think requested is a mild word. We actually begged the hospital to put in a DNAR or to not do CPR. And they said that it was a legal necessity. So it was absolute pure torture for my wife to witness when 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 her mother's heartbeat stopped, which is which it was going to. We knew because she was in multi organ failure to sit there and stand there and watch while her ribs were being broken through CPR. And I am so glad that now we have rules about do not resuscitate orders in India because futile treatment, futile treatment is actually torture. 
and that I'm, I'm glad one of those things has changed and I am exceptionally grateful that the Indian Society of Palliative Care and the Indian Society for Critical Care Medicine they have at various times asked me to come and talk to them about this sort of stuff because the just like I, I treat intensive care like neurosurgery so or cardiac surgery or whatever you will so you go and assess the patient and you decide then you have to decide in consultation with the patient and their family what their chance of survival is and what resources you have and then some patients would want to go ahead regardless of what the chances are however then comes the difficult bit what your resources are and that's where triage comes in and that is where the emotional decision making component and the emotional load comes in and that is where you then have to think about okay well actually you 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 don't you have to think about a lot but that is the burden that you carry so many years ago five of my colleagues we decided we 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 started with a blog which was called those we carry and basically it is every one that works in intensive care has ghosts that they carry with them and because that's that's the hard decision making there when you are short of resources what are you going to do who do you remember the first time you had to do that yes i'm not going to describe it but what i can tell you is actually it is much easier to do it in person when you are a junior doctor because you can ring up the boss at home and the boss carries the responsibility because you can just write in the notes discussed with the consultant <laughs> and uh, not for icu because of very poor prognosis or very poor chance of survival or whatever however when you become a consultant then suddenly all that load is on your shoulders so you get a phone call in the middle of the night how do you decide on the phone you want to go and see the patient so you do that so for the first many years you go and see patients and then you realize okay there are some registrars that you know depending on the grade and reliability of the registrar you have uh, on the night shift uh you can decide whether to go in or whether to just trust them on the phone but it is really hard however the responsibility is always yours and can you get sued sorry can you get sued oh absolutely so i go to court roughly 3 to 4 times a year so it is it is extremely 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 common however because the 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 judicial system works a lot more quickly than in india i generally remember the patients when i get there <laughs> rather than you know having to rely on 15 year old notes and <laughs> and it tends to be very very reasonable so the coroner will generally especially if you've got 
two or three consultant opinions, the coroner will just will accept your decision. It is very uncommon to be to to have a formal adversarial confrontation, if that makes any sense. So it tends to be initial coroner hearing and that's about it. It it has only happened a couple of times that my insurance company has had to pay out and they actually both times paid out with and this has happened with my colleagues as well they pay out with a non-disclosure agreement basically not admitting liability and paying out a small amount of money but bus basically acha hindi mein bolta hmm bolte hain ke yaar इससे ज्यादा पैसे तो वकील ले लेगा तो इनको पैसे दो और इनको जाने दो इतने पैसे दे देते हैं और इनको जाने देते हैं बट वी विल राइट एन एग्रीमेंट विच मेक्स श्योर वी आर नॉट एडमिटिंग फॉल्ट वी आर जस्ट पेइंग यू टू गो अवे दिस इज एन सेटलमेंट तो बेसिकली इट इज अ केस ऑफ केयर ओके इफ द इफ द amount of money is less than the lawyer's fees basically just pay up and let them go and again i'm not personally paying it's the insurance company but it it yeah. has only happened twice in 25 years so it is very very uncommon let's double click on one of the four principles you spoke about which is a principle of autonomy which of course as every good libertarian would know is like our supreme principle that you know with the right to self ownership we own ourselves all our freedoms kind of emerge from that and therefore autonomy is supremely important now there are other contexts to this one is of course deciding on the do not resuscitate or an informed patient saying i prefer this treatment over no treatment or just keep me comfortable and that's one aspect of autonomy there are two other aspects of autonomy which strike me as uh, interesting and they're perhaps going along a continuum and at some people people will get you know uncomfortable with uh, with those and, and and one of them of course is euthanasia that supposing i have some kind of fatal disease even if at the moment i'm okay i decide ki nahi yaar matlab ki i want to end it now I know I'm going to die anyway. I should have the right to do so. I believe in Switzerland you can rent out a particular facility where they put you to death in a particular humane way and blah blah blah. But you choose when you want to die, which seems to me to be something we should all be allowed to do because hey, we own ourselves and um, the state doesn't own us and therefore it is up to us. And from this then comes the other question of suicide. For example, if we have the right to our own life, we have the right to take it as well. And often of course suicide comes out of mental health problems, but sometimes it can be, you know, I can say that hey, I'm rational, I'm sick of this world, I want to go, and uh, why can't I? And this is something that most people will say no no, like in in India for example, suicide is the one crime for which you only get punished if you fail at it. So, you know, so what what are sort of your thoughts on these two because i think the logical extension for most reasonable people would be to say that yeah i agree with euthanasia agar fatal hai and all of that then you should have the right to rid yourself of pain and rid your family of pain but they won't take it that one step further i mean at the end of the day life is a fatal disease anyway so why should you not would not opt out when you want to uh, you are absolutely right and i have often joked that i have never ever in my life saved a life main 25 saal se icu kar raha hu maine i have never saved any lives all i have ever done is postpone death wow because that is all you can do you can never save lives no one can save a life all you can do is postpone death The, the 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 second thing you said uh, about suicide i agree that unless so if you are if you have severe mental health issues and you are not capable of rational decision making i would say ke ha if if a psychiatrist judges you to be 
incapable of making that decision, you sh- you can be put in protective custody. But if you are rational, if you are capable of making a decision, you have autonomy. And I understand I'm not completely up to date with Indian law. In my time in India, 25 years ago, we actually had to report every attempted suicide to the nearest police station. Um, I understand that the Supreme Court has now upheld that you can, if you are mentally competent, an attempt to suicide is not a criminal offence. I could be wrong. I don't, I don't know. I, I am, As I said, I'm not up to date completely with Indian law on suicide. However, it is interesting that even in countries where suicide is not a criminal offense, that is most of Europe, America, you, you still have to wear a helmet when you're riding a motorcycle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And to have a seat belt on when you're in a car. Why? Because <laughs> you you could count that as an attempt to suicide. <laughs> and, and just speaking of incentives, Steven Landsberg in uh, one of his early books, uh, I think, uh, I forget the name, uh, some economist was in the title, but Steven Landsberg in one of his early books spoke about how accident rates went up after seat belts and helmets were made compulsory because people who wore them felt safer and drove more rashly. Uh, <laughs> so you, it can also go the other way. It could, But yeah, on, on, on yes. principle, yeah, I get your yeah, point. Yeah. yeah, these are different things. Yeah, and and actually, helmets for motorcycles are great because helmets mean that... Have you seen the study that said that more motorcyclists made it to the hospital after helmets became compulsory. They still died, but um, mm. their organs could, could be donated. Wow. So, so, yeah, so, so helmets uh, essentially made donor cycles rather than motorcycles. Seen and unseen, kar diya aapne to. <laughs> donor cycle. <laughs> yeah, helmets may not save the lives of those who wear them, but they save the lives of others because yeah, the organs yeah, are intact. Yeah, helmet saves lots of lives. Yeah, wow, this is a, a good way to uh, sort of think about it. Tell me more about end of life care because my like my father in his last years I remember mm-hmm. a year before he died and he was kind of going off Parkinson's eventually he went in an intensive ward when he got COVID during the second wave among other things that he had but he would keep urging me to read Atul Gawande is being mortal and he was saying not enough people talk about this and we should talk more about this so, and so on so and so forth. I am so grateful that you've mentioned Atul Gawande because Atul Gawande is being mortal not because Atul is the best palliative care or end-of-life specialist in the world, but because of because he is such... He's probably the most well-read medical author out there. So I am very grateful to Atul for having written that book. And yes, more people should have choices around how they treat their end of life. Do you want to get admitted to hospital? Do you want to be admitted to essentially a palliative care ca- a palliative care facility? Do you want some sort of home care? And there is a huge amount of evidence, uh, both from Europe and America, uh, there isn't much from India because the the, the, the the facility does just does not exist in India. That people with incurable diseases or people who are going to die anyway actually survive longer and are happier with some sort of hospice or palliative care facility. Uh, and that can range... In, in in many ways. So, India mein to joint family hoti hai. Baad logon ki. 
ठीक है और वी लाइक टू प्रिटेंड एंड आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू पुल एनी पंच इज हियर वी लाइक टू प्रिटेंड दैट ओ और बच्चे जो हैं वो ख्याल रखेंगे सच में कोई ख्याल नहीं रखता या देर आर अ लॉट ऑफ इंस्टेंसेस वेर यू नो इन स्पाइट ऑफ बींग इन जॉइंट फैमिलीज एंड हैविंग हैड द एडवांटेजेस ऑफ जॉइंट फैमिलीज इन द यंगर लाइफ पीपल डू नॉट लुक आफ्टर देयर एडर्स सो वॉट वी हैव इज यू कैन हैव एंड ऑफ लाइफ केयर सो पेलिएटिव केयर यू कैन यू कैन स्टार्ट इट फ्रॉम ओके वेन यू स्टार्ट गेटिंग स्लाइटली डिसेबल्ड so you can either privately or publicly funded whatever it is depending on your healthcare system you have carers that come in so initially you start with acha yahan pe to kisi ke paas maid nahi hoti hai india mein initially you start with india mein to everyone has a cleaner and <laughs> no one has to wash their own dishes but initially you can start with someone that comes in twice a day helps you cooks for you and helps you bathe change your clothes then you go over to you know four times a day two people coming in three or four times a day to take you to the loo change your clothes keep everything clean then you go over to you know 24/7 care then you go over to 24/7 care which is more specialized which is rather than you know untrained workers you need a nurse who is going to give you your medication who is going to look after you then you and and then you go to 24/7 care with prescribed medication prescribed pain medication or should i say prescribed uh, licensed pain medication so not just paracetamol and brufen yeah. but some sort of Morphine opioids haan ji so some sort of na- opioids which have to be licensed so you 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 can have a variety of these things and what you need is to have really access to a spectrum of these things and ideally hamari family mein panch generation mein kisi ne mere nau chache hain kisi ne kabhi will nahi banayi we have as indians this tendency to not plan about the future main galat to nahi bol raha bilkul sahi bol rahe ho we have this tendency to say if you teri to kaali zubaan hai to galat bol raha hai hamare hamare to every time i have suggested to anyone in any of my elders when okay i'm nearly 50 now so <laughs> this was a few years ago but every time i suggested to any of my elders that they should have a will they should have succession planning they should have an end of life plan they should think about you know a dnar anything like that it was always teri kali zuban so we have this thing where we do not like to plan about the future we do not like to have unlike the army does where you know you have or crisis plans we do not like to personally plan for our future which is crazy what we should have is we should have a will and we, we should have a financial plan a retirement plan most people's retirement plan is acha mera beta mera khayal rakhega unless they are in a government job with a pension and you should have a medical plan a living will some sort of indication to your family insurance some sort of indication and 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 definitely actually not an indication an expressly written thing about okay what do i want to do if i am severely ill and 
incapacitated where I cannot tell you my wishes. So they are written down here expressly. They could be, do not do anything. I am, I've lived in enough. I do not want any more. Or, okay, talk to the doctors, talk to, talk to the healthcare professionals. And if it is likely that I'm going to be severely disabled, let me go. Or whatever. You, you, you choose. It is autonomy, isn't it? We were talking about autonomy. This whole discussion started around autonomy. And again, I firmly think that the word you used earlier, euthanasia, is a very loaded word. So, I personally... When I teach, I talk about a either, so I, I talk about what you would conventionally call, euth, call euthanasia. So euthanasia is, if a patient is on a ventilator, I talk to the family, I tell them that the patient is 100% going to die, so we should switch off the ventilator now. Is that euthanasia? That's just end of treatment. It's not really euthanasia. I mean, to me, euthanasia is when I know that I'm going to die in 9 to 12 months, but I say, hey, I'm not going to spend exactly. too much money keeping myself going. Abhi so, karo. Uh, so you are, so now you have defined the word in your words. However, to most of the public, euthanasia, there are two types of euthanasia. Ek hai passive euthanasia. So, Passive euthanasia is when we say, okay, this patient is dying, so they're going to die in 10, 12, 15 hours anyway. Why are we torturing them with more procedures? Let's stop now. That is passive euthanasia. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Then you have active euthanasia. And in my, and as you said, Okay, active euthanasia is when you go to Dignitas and say, okay, I want to stop things. So I, the problem is that a lot of people, unlike you, when you say euthanasia, they think of it as death passive. panels or passive euthanasia or all of that stuff. So euthanasia is a very, very loaded term. And I, 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 I never, ever use that word. Just because euthanasia to me is... Okay, jo, have you seen Platoon? Yeah, Oliver Stone. So when some bullets are hit, he says, okay, let's kill me. I don't want to suffer anymore. And he's given a headshot. So that is euthanasia. We don't do euthanasia. Or Yokio Mishima's seppuku, if I remember correctly. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Here's a here's a question for you. So you know autonomy, yes, and the interesting thing is autonomy can actually be used differently by many people, and it can be used differently from how they state they'd use it. For example, economists have this term called reveal preferences, where they look at your preferences not by what you say but by what you actually do. And earlier you had spoken about degrees of being unwell. So degrees in sense of ki pehle din mein ek bar koi aayega, khana banayega, chale jayega, then two nurses will come and they'll bathe you every day and so on. And the degrees get worse and worse. And I think the human tendency would always be to think that this degree is tolerable. If it gets much worse, they'll choose to go. So when you are actively making those decisions, you will essentially leave it until it's too late for you to decide anymore. And what must be also stopping people from putting a DNR on themselves and have thought about it as much as you and I have but what would otherwise stop people from putting a DNR on themselves is just a thing of that there is 
a border line beyond which they do not want to be resuscitated but before which they would want to would want another chance and they would be scared that the people in charge might err on the other side or wherever they draw that line and in revealed preferences i think many people would actually uh, you know abhi to bravado se keh dete hai ki nahi mujhe nahi jeena hai you know agar main you know i've been an army man if i have to be in a wheelchair main nahi jaunga but then when the time comes i'll choose because i want to live 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 you know so that also i mean do you think that that's like a psychological barrier that people who otherwise profess support for it won't really do it in their own cases and similarly the instinct not to make a will might be coming out of this illusion of immortality where you imagine that we all in a sense of we live in a way as if we imagine we will live forever though rationally we know we won't but we imagine we'll we we'll live in that way na ki theek hai daru lao peete hai you know so uh, <laughs> i never say that but i'm just saying we should if anyone's heard the liver doctor episode you should know that daru should be strictly avoided but have three cups of black coffee a day that's very healthy yeah so i, I, um, I, I work in the biggest liver i see you in europe you should know what I feel about this <laughs> but yeah huh, uh, I agree that uh, I mean I'm a huge so about 20 years ago I read Freakonomics mm-hmm. which introduced me to the whole concept of behavioral economics and and actually behavioral economics is behavioral psychology and it is behavioral medicine so yes i've tried to incorporate many of the principles into my personal practice lots of people have written about it and as you know that behavioral economics has actually and and q theory have uh, played a part in how organ transplants waiting lists are done इन बोथ यूरोप एंड अमेरिका इंडिया में तो सिर्फ पैसे के हिसाब से चलता है ना तो इट इज़ अ डिफरेंट स्टोरी सो आई एम सॉरी आई कैन नॉट रिलेट दिस टू इंडिया बट यस आई एग्री दैट द ऑप्टिमिज्म बायस टेंट टू बी ह्यूजली स्ट्रॉन्ग एंड अ लॉट ऑफ पीपल are prone to the optimism optimism bias and i do not know why but asians india mein bhi yahan pe bhi mm. uh, tend to be more prone to that ki will bhi nahi banayenge end of life decision making mein bhi problem and i don't exactly know why why we do why we culturally have a problem with making forward looking decisions the only forward looking decisions that i see our elders making is investing in real estate nothing else and that's a backward looking decision because real estate mostly especially in india is a liability not an asset I completely agree with you. <laughs> I completely agree with you. <laughs> However, that is just what <laughs> what what happens, you know, fixed deposits, real estate, that's about it. So, there is some kind of socio-cultural bias against forward thinking. And uh, this is something that actually I think you and possibly shruti rajgopalan uh, could have a better idea of than i could cuz i don't know man no man i have no idea about the why of it especially what you just told me that is not only indians in india it's also indians there yeah. who have more of an optimism bias than their counterparts and i can't figure that out why what are your, what are your candidate reasons <laughs> i have no idea it is that बुरा सोचोगे तो बुरा होगा तो बुरा सोचो ही ना तेरी का ठीक है ये ये दैट इज द ओनली टू थिंग्स आई कैन थिंक ऑफ आप बताओ नहीं आई आई कॉन्ट थिंक ऑफ एनी थिंग आई थिंक 
all explanations including these and explanations like oh they think on a longer time scale because they believe in re- rebirth yeah, and whatever what. i i don't i don't buy any of these explanations because i think that uh, reveal preferences would indicate that these are not the case and in other contexts indians can actually be quite forward thinking and canny for example you know a marwari with his money will be extremely practical <laughs> and rational and canny uh, so uh, why achha. should the same marwari not be that way with his life acha to dhiro bhai ne kya bill banayi thi मुझे अंबानी जी ने क्या बिल बनाई थी और उनके बच्चों का क्या हुआ धीरू भाई आपके भाई होंगे मुझे नहीं पता <laughs> तो उनके देखो बेसिकली टाटाज अंबानी किसी ने बिल बनाई है ढंग से मन उनके धीरू भाई अंबानी के मरने के बाद बेटों में लड़ाई हुई मम्मी ने सुधा करवाई उसके बाद एक बैंक करप्ट होके बैठ गया सो इफ द रिचेस्ट मैन इन इंडिया आफ्टर हैविंग टू स्ट्रोक्स स्टिल डिड नॉट मेक अ विल ओके यू टेल मी अबाउट रिवील्ड प्रेफरेंसेस yeah i i i can't dispute that i can't come up with a reason for it but this shows both a lack of will and a lack of will and <laughs> i i i don't have a reason for it yeah huh. but this is this is so i am just being not being a psychologist or an economist i am just going to call this asian mentality this is not just india because i see मेरा जो हॉस्पिटल है सो आई बेसिकली लिव इन वॉट इन अ टी वी सीरियल वॉज कॉल्ड द कैपिटल ऑफ ब्रिटिश पाकिस्तान सो बेसिकली एंड 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 वी ऑफन फर्गेट दैट इंडियन पंजाब ओनली हैज अ पॉपुलेशन ऑफ टू टू एंड हाफ करोड़ पाकिस्तानी पंजाब हैज अ पॉपुलेशन ऑफ ट्वेल्व करोड़ एंड लाहौर इज एज बिग एज डेली डेढ़ करोड़ का पॉपुलेशन है लाहौर का तो my population is basically india pakistan bangladesh china especially hong kong chinese mm-hmm. uh, malaysians singapore so basically it's all it's pan asian rather than just mr. one Kureshi. ethnic group mr kureshi plays golf ha bilkul the isliye and it is pan asian mm. sabka yahi hal so i don't know why this is as i said i, I am not a, an economist i am not a psychologist i don't understand why but the brits the europeans the americans are much more likely to have forward planning in terms of end of life care in terms of wills than are most asians are and that is not just india it is as i said most asians and i don't know why mm. so you know fabulous insights on uh, sort of end of life and let's take a step back and you know continue talking about intensive care and so on and one of the sort of interesting things that you've pointed out about the journey of intensive care is that back in the day when you had started out and it you always assumed that you know as time goes by there'll be better drugs there'll be more technology the science will evolve but over time you've realized that intensive care really involves fewer drugs less technology and one of your most resonant quotes i think it came from one of the simplified episodes which are linked from the show notes where you say that it's a care not the treatment right i wanted uh, to sort of elaborate on all of these absolutely so what we found is over time we in in the 80s 90s early 2000s so until about 15 18 years ago we were looking for wonder drugs we were looking for miracle treatments we were looking for magic bullets silver bullets bol do silver bullets <laughs> <laughs> to mm. kill vampires <laughs> so we were looking for magic solutions to stuff and then what we found was just like you know 
how many medals Britain wins in cycling in every Olympics. And what they did was, it was small things. It is not one big thing. And that is... The term by Dave, the term by Dave Brailsford was the aggregation of marginal gains. Absolutely. That's, Thank you. Yeah. That is exactly what I was going for, except I did not want to sound too conceited by saying that. So, <laughs> the aggregation of marginal gains is exactly what intensive care is about. So, over the last 20 years, what we've learned is less is more. So, you do not look for magic solutions and you realize that actually we do not understand human physiology as well as we think. So, the less we do, the better it is. So instead of, for instance, and I, I use this, I've used this analogy on multiple lectures, podcasts, whatever. So, for instance, in the 1990s, we would try when we were ventilating someone to give them normal lung volume. Okay? Uh, you are giving normal lung volume, but half of your lung, uh, so normal breath volume. Hmm? Half of your lung is filled with pneumonia. So what you are doing is you are overstretching the other half of the lung. So basically, if you have a balloon, you overinflate it 25 times. What happens to the balloon? Pop. Yeah, it gets wrinkled, less stretchy than before or more stretchy than before. Basically, it becomes deformed. So, we used to do that. We used to try and, you know, inflate the lung to a normal volume. And then we realized that actually, after a big, big study proved that actually, lower lung volumes, lower breath, breath volumes... volumes actually improve mortality because otherwise what you're doing is if you're over inflating the half of the lung the healthy bits of the lung you are essentially you are if you over inflate it that will also get inflamed so basically you are destroying the healthy lung that you have so Lower volumes actually improve um, mortality. In the same way, we discovered that lower blood pressures are actually slightly better for you, especially if you are actively bleeding. Because if you are actively bleeding and your blood pressure is high, blood will keep pumping out. If we, if we, keep, if we start giving you blood, until we have controlled the bleeding, we should actually have a lower blood pressure for you. So, essentially, it's a case of less is more. So, it is about care rather than treatment. It's the same with a lot of other things. So, a lot of things that we do come in what we call care bundles. So, we talked about ventilation. It also comes with regular suction, regular repositioning of the patient, avoiding pressure sores. If we have a pressure sore in, in, on a patient, that is a major incident. I can't remember the last time we had a pressure sore on a patient. So the patients have to be turned every two hours. You have to have pneumatic mattresses. It's about the little things. So intensive care is essentially, as you said, about marginal gains, about the little things, and then trying to individualize treatment. I'm also curious about 
another aspect of it and this goes back to perhaps my earlier question on how many doctors are ticking boxes and going through the motions and how many are actually staying in touch and it seems to me that a lot of what you have to do especially in in, in intensive care is stay in touch with the actual science think about the actual science think about the why and not just the what you know just in the case of why it is better to have like lower breath volume that pehle hum galat the this is why we were wrong this is why we must do this or as uh, in a case i think you dis- uh, discussed with our mutual friend arrange you know about how his dad in intensive care was given oxygen saturation levels that were kept at 100 where actually today we know the optimal thing is don't keep it at 100 keep it in the 90s and you know so on and so forth that the ones who are kept at 100 actually become worse which indeed unfortunately happened to his dad and i'm thinking that there is like a two way thing here one is understanding the signs understanding the basic principles which is something that you know apart from um, history you mentioned your other great love was physics which obviously uh, indicates that you have a love for foundational principles so at one level i'm guessing that understanding the science and keeping in touch with it will make you a better doctor per se but at another level at a different level understanding those principles will also help you do things on the fly do you know jugar for lack of a better term or improvise in conditions which might not be optimal just like in rotak for example where you need to cool the oxygen cylinders instead of heating them so tell me a little bit about the importance of doctors always thinking on their feet whether it's regard to applying the science to their uh, medical treatment or, and care or whether it's with applying the science to adapt to different kinds of circumstances and always being nimble that way like how many doctors are actually like this you know does the healthcare system they're operating in like the english system being you know uh, demand uh, having that kind of regulation that you keep upgrading yourself does that also matter and is that something you have to be intentional about or is it very easy to slip into a groove okay uh, now this is going to be a a long one okay <laughs> please please <laughs> so, uh, go ahead what i will say is that the best doctors i worked with or worked yeah worked with in my life have been in india and the best doctors the best jugadu doctors especially have been in india the problem is that the worst doctors i have worked with have also been in india mm. so th- so massive variance and the difficult conditions make the best very good because they adapt but the bad education and the difficult conditions also make the worst very bad that is exactly right i would add poor regulation to that and yeah but but you 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 are absolutely right i would agree with that it is about that the really good ones actually have a chance to get better and the the conditions actually give them a chance to innovate and actually in some ways the lack of regulation also gives them a chance to innovate because they don't have to jump through 300 hoops to for for to, to do something new whereas over here yeah you would have to go through 100 ethical committees to do that stuff but the bad ones get kicked out by the system over here while in india they just keep going so i would suggest that the average level of doctors over here is better than in india but the really good ones in india are extremely good they are yeah they they are extremely good So you know I've taken a lot of your time today and there's one particular mystery subject which uh, you have offered to do a full episode with me uh, on a few months into the future which uh, demands a full episode of its own so let's not touch upon it now but one of the things that I really enjoy about uh, you know the few conversations that we've had are really the kind of storytelling skills you bring to the table so I will and you said you have at least three or four really interesting stories uh, which one can draw lessons from which have learnings and blah 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 so so bataiye uh, let's start okay some of it will be actually mildly amusing some will be slightly darker so one of my hobbies for almost 15 years was 
I ran an ICU follow-up clinic. So ICU patients who get discharged. So have you ever thought about how many soldiers who've been in active battle, how many of them have PTSD? A significant number is what I believe, right? Yeah, more than 20%. Mm. Do you know that ICU survivors have a PTSD rate of over 30%? Wow. More than soldiers that went to Afghanistan. Wow. Because that is the metric I have to compare to. Because in India, I don't have any metric. Hai nahi. So the metric I have to compare to is, because we are the UK's defense medical center as well. So the metric is that my normal ICU patients have just as much or more PTSD than soldiers that were in active battle. So, so fighting Lord Yama is much harder than fighting the Taliban. Uh, yes, pretty much. Yes. And that results from a number of things. It is my mother was admitted to COVID ICU two years ago. So we're starting with the dark. We'll, we'll go to the funny later. Mm. My mother was admitted to COVID ICU two, two and a half years ago in India. Luckily, I have contacts. So I was able to arrange a bed for her and stuff like that. And the specialist, the intensivist and the charge nurse would let me video chat and, you know, give me videos of, send me photos and videos of test results and stuff. However, my mother came back with significant trauma. And one of the things was she said that she'd been and I've, I've had to with this with a lot of people, but I can say this about my, my mother because I have permission. Sexually assaulted in intensive care. Why? You are in intensive care. You are half asleep. So you are half sedated. Someone puts a catheter in you. A urinary catheter. Someone is cleaning you up after you have passed stools. So basically, multiple times a day, people are touching what you would very gently say is intimate areas of your body. And if you are half sedated and you do not understand what is going on. What would it feel like? And this is one of the things that we do not think about. And a lot, at least 20 to 30 percent of ICU survivors remember this and they remember it in a really bad way. And you have to essentially push them to get the memories out of them. So this is this is one of the things that we n never think about or hardly ever think about. And especially if you are not working in intensive care. So you never thought about this? This is mind-blowing to me. It's like the first time I'm hearing of this and yet it seems so logical and, and obviously way, way worse for women and a man probably wouldn't even think of this yeah. angle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And then you think about menstruating women who have their periods while they are in intensive care, while they are sedated. So it is, it is, it is a significant thing that we do not talk about because we we just we just ignore it 
about 20 to 30 percent of my patients in uh, ICU follow-up clinic end up having to be referred to a psychologist or a psychotherapist, uh, whatever you want to say, because they have ongoing issues with what happened. So, for instance, and this is anonymized, and I've, I've, I've given this talk at three, three different conferences. So, I had a patient called Amy who came to us with a severe infection, was ventilated, stayed in ICU for a couple of weeks, and then about a year later, her family came over to talk to me and said that she was having significant mental problems. So we talked to her. And it was basically she did not believe that she had been in intensive care. She believed that she had been kidnapped by Colombian drug lords and she'd been taken to Colombia by a ship and that her family had then ransomed her and then while during her time in Colombia she had been tortured and sexually assaulted. Like, what? How does this work? Then I asked the family if she would come in and she did and it still didn't make any sense. So we looked back through her hospital records. At that point, this is pre-Brexit, we had a significant number of Spanish nurses. Mm. So what was happening was, so you are sedated, you have nurses talking at handover in Spanish, Hamare jo prescription chart hai. A lot of people call it the drug chart. Oh. So you're saying drug, 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 drug chart. Okay. And the ship thing. We have pneumatic mattresses. So air mattress, which basically rolls the patient around a little bit. So the boat ship thing is very common in our ICU survivors. So you put all of that together, you're talking, and you're sticking needles into the patient every day. You're cleaning the patient, you're changing their menstrual pants. You're putting a urinary catheter in, sexual assault. You put all of that together and suddenly it's like, yeah, okay. So I was on a ship, there were people talking about drugs. There were people sticking needles into me, so torturing me. And there was sexual assault going on. And once we put it together and managed to explain it, she got better. I still get Christmas cards from her. This is 20 years ago. And I still get Christmas cards from her lives in Australia now, and as I said, suitably anonymized and with permission. On the other hand, one of my consultants, one of my bosses about 15 years ago, told me that I am destroying personally, I'm personally destroying human evolution. You? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a weekend. I'm on Burns Intensive Care. And we get our first patient. The first patient is someone who has very bad lungs, lung cancer. So he's on oxygen in a wheelchair. So our oxygen tank is on the back, the wheelchair. And he has oxygen on his face nasal prongs 
and while on the oxygen he decides to smoke as soon as he lights up the lighter basically oxygen cylinder sab kuch everything blows up so he comes to burns i see you so <laughs> we we spent about 5 hours stabilizing him as soon as we finished stabilizing this guy i get a phone call from another hospital which doesn't have a burns icu so they want to transfer the patient to us where the story is this patient got throat cancer laryngeal cancer from smoking so he has a permanent tracheostomy so what he's done is he's fashioned sort of plastic contraption to so that he can smoke through his tracheostomy oh my god you pura darwin's law you're getting at right this is why you're messing with evolution <laughs> <laughs> the genes would have been like wiped out and you're keeping and, them and, going and, and, and then as he's smoking he coughs and he happens to inhale the burning cigarette so now he has burns in his trachea and bronchi and so they have to, they transfer him to us we have to actually put a bronchoscope in and get the cigarette out first time i've heard of a guy inhaling a cigarette itself <laughs> wow wow <laughs> and and burning his trachea fucking amazing. after having surgery for throat cancer because of smoking okay so <laughs> I, i've run out of sympathy there have been many sad stories in your episode doctor but i've run out of sympathy for these two guys so so uh, that evening <laughs> when the boss comes for the <laughs> rounds <laughs> he says nitin <laughs> you are messing with human evolution ye kaisa tha ye bahut acha tha but on the i mean i mean obviously your boss was joking but if these people aren't reproducing which i guess they left trouble reproducing after this you're not really messing with evolution the genes aren't getting back in there yeah so good okay yeah and then i'll tell you about how i stopped the Irish war <laughs> from from restarting kindly explain <laughs> I will I will <laughs> so again we had a patient who was with us for a couple of weeks now this will need a visual explanation theek hai to main aapko na abhi aap mujhe dikhaoge lekin mere listeners kya dekhenge um we'll put it in the show, show notes i'll Thieke. send you a link you'll to send put me it in the show notes done done theek hai aapko to mere sare so, lines pata hai should we'll put it in the hmm. show notes so i I'll, I'll, i'll email it uh, or whatsapp it to you mm-hmm. so basically you know that there was a very prolonged conflict in ireland between protestants catholics ira ye wo so we had a patient and at this point i was in manchester so we had a patient who was with us for a couple of weeks got better went home fine his family contact me because i was running the follow up clinic and they said that his brothers and cousins want to kill him because he was a protestant now he wants to become a catholic why यही तो कहानी है सो सो आई सेड ओके फाइन गेट हिम इन गॉट हिम इन एंड ही सेज वेल बिकॉज आई वॉज गोइंग टू डाई यू ऑल टोल्ड मी आई वॉज प्रॉबेबली गोइंग टू डाई एंड द ओनली रीजन आई सर्वाइव इज दैट देर वर नंस प्रेइंग फॉर मी लाइक वॉट cuz protestants don't have nuns catholics have nuns so he wants to convert to catholicism now and we are like what what is this then we said okay why don't you uh, do you want to come and see have a tour of the icu because we do that with a lot of our patients and mm. uh, his wife remembered what bed he was in because we didn't remember what bed he was in so mm. his wife said he was here and we went to there and it was fine and then i walked up to the head end of the bed 
एंड ऑपोजिट वॉल पे ना वी हैव ऑक्सीजन सिलेंडर्स इन आई सी यू विच आर अबाउट फोर फुट हाई दे आर ब्लैक विद वाइट शोल्डर्स वाह ही सेड उससे फिर पूछा ओके सो हाउ मेनी ही सेड समाइम्स देर आर थ्री बट देर वॉज ऑलवेज एट लीस्ट वन क्योंकि हम हमेशा hmm. एक ऑक्सीजन सिलेंडर तो रखते हैं कभी तीन रखते हैं एंड दैट ऑक्सीजन सिलेंडर टू हाफ सेडेटेड पर्सन वुड लुक लाइक अ नन इन हर ब्लैक एंड वाइट हैबिट एंड नीलिंग क्योंकि चार फुट है ना नीलिंग सो ही वांटेड टू बिकम अ कैथोलिक बिकॉज ही मिस्ड टू ऑक्सीजन सिलेंडर्स फॉर नन्स अरोरा साहब आपने तो कमाल कर दिया ये कैसी डॉक्टरी होगी आई प्रिवेंटेड रिलीजियस वायलेंस इन आयरलैंड दिस गाय वॉज विजिटिंग फ्रॉम आयरलैंड और भी बहुत कहानियां पर फिर 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 कभी बात करेंगे और कहानियों की एंड वी सेड दे इज अनदर टॉपिक दैट वी विल टॉक अबाउट definitely At another point in, in a few <laughs> months before i let you go a penultimate question my ultimate question of course is preplanned but my penultimate question is taking off from that very disturbing first story that you mentioned about you know uh, all, all these women imagining that there was sexual assault happening because in a sense when they are half sedated they do find their you know uh, private parts being uh, invaded as it were when they don't really know what's going on and they haven't explicitly consented and that's actually a really disturbing situation because you don't want to leave anybody with trauma of that sort what are the ways to mitigate it like what are the ways to make sure that i mean w- what can one do about it because i generally recognize that we live in a world designed by men for men and everything right down to the air conditioning temperature in offices is designed for men and i i imagine that in a previous time something like this would not appear to be a problem because no man would feel like this and you would just gaslight the women but this is this seems to me to be a real serious problem if women are left with the trauma and the memories of sexual assault even if it wasn't actually sexual assault so you know what can be done to mitigate this okay so one of the things that we have very consciously tried in the last many years is that we keep sedation as light as possible and we try to have our patients to be able to understand what's going on and before you touch a patient before you approach a patient all of our nurses all of our doctors what we do is we explain to them we try and talk to them and again it is it is difficult because you have to have a certain level of sedation to have all the tubes and the ventilator in so but what we do is we try and explain every time before we touch the patient what we are trying to do we talk to patients all the time we try and have their families there for a lot of time and what 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 we found is that having families and this is what made covid icu harder because there were no families there what we found is having families there 24/7 or whenever they want and talking to the patient actually helps a lot because that makes them feel not just connected to the world but also safer mm. and before you do anything intimate or anything painful to the patient you explain it to them you explain it to the family and before you discharge the patient you also explain to the family that they are but well, to the patient obviously and to the family that it is likely there's a 20 25% chance that they'll have some sort of ptsd delirium something and that we have a follow up clinic and we will follow them up on the ward as well and you and the family have to keep explaining that they were sick they were in hospital they were having medical procedures rather than memories of 
what, what, what you could understand as sexual assault. So that is the key. It is about, it is all about communication. As we've said before, and as actually you said it, <laughs> quoting me <laughs> from earlier, that intensive care is about care more than treatment. Yeah, and, 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 and these are very wise words. And in the long run, perhaps treatment is not possible at all because we're all going to die anyway. As you said, you've never saved a life. And, you know, I mean, earlier I said that I never want to die in an intensive care unit. But I wouldn't mind dying if a Colombian drug cartel was to kidnap me and try experiments on me. That would be a funky way to go. So, no, you're, you're shaking your head. You don't think so. You've experienced Colombian drug cartels, it seems. So, so on that a wonderful note, we've had a great conversation. I feel like there's a lot else to talk about which we will save for the next episode. So listeners have something to look forward to. But I'll ask you to end the show by recommending for me and my listeners books, films, music, any kind of art, which means a lot to you. Not it doesn't even have to be about your subject, but which means a lot to you and you'd love to share with the world. Okay. I will suggest two. Okay. Actually, I will put a thread on Twitter later. I'll share a thread uh, with you, which you can put in the show notes. Done. But the two that I would definitely recommend, actually, there are three. Uh, two by Atul Gawande. One is the check checklist. Manifesto. The checklist manifesto. The other is being mortal. And the third is when breath becomes air. Paul Kalanidhi. And the fourth one, actually, uh, which, I, which 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 should have been first is the classic book on behavioral economics. Abatana. Kahneman ki book, right? Hanji, bilkul. Yeah, yeah. I, I I mean I've re I've read so many books on behavioral economics before that even came out that yeah, in yeah, my yeah, mind yeah, yeah, there are just yeah, a whole yeah, bunch yeah, of yeah, them. Yeah. So 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 but, by Danny Kahneman mm -hmm. and, and currently thinking fast and slow is what you're talking about. That's the one. That's the one. That is the one. So you just thought slow, it's okay. I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought slow. Yeah. But uh, that is classic and that actually happens. You know, a behavioral heuristics are a real thing. And these guys basically invented this whole field or discovered this whole field because it was probably invented 20,000 years ago. <laughs> when we started talking. Absolutely. So, Nitin, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. You've made me determined uh, to uh, to die in dignity. I completed the sentence. I could have put a full stop at die. But it's it's. Uh, I've learned a lot from this conversation. I'll listen to it again and I'll kind of process it over time. And there was at least one mind-blowing TIL in that towards the end. So, I learned a lot. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. It has been pleasure and an honor to be on your podcast and i'm looking forward to coming back next year thank you if you enjoyed listening to this episode send it to whoever you think might be interested check out the show notes enter rabbit holes at will you can follow nitin on twitter at aurora drn this will also be linked from the show notes and you can follow me on twitter at amit varma a m i t v a r m a you can browse past episodes of the scene and the unseen at sceneunseen.in Thank you for listening. Did you enjoy this episode of The Scene and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to sceneunseen.in slash support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you. <laughs>